Alan Wake is the definition of mediocrity, middling gameplay, perfectly serviceable, but nothing innovative, the story is dumb, with plenty of plot holes, but ultimately harmless if taken as context for the action, it has that certain 2010 era jank and storytelling sensibilities. Looking back, it's one of those products where I go, yeah, that certainly was a video game that existed. I would never recommend it to anyone, but I didn't completely despise my time with it either. Still, everything that has ever existed has a cult following, and the story was obviously left open in the hopes of a sequel. And there were some curious gameplay ideas that could be expanded upon. And so, here we are, 13 years later, with a decent hype campaign leading to its release, Remedy unleashed Alan Wake Part 2 to the world, and it has gained nothing but universal praise. It's a masterpiece, one of the best games of 2023, a new standard in video game storytelling, Sam Lake is a visionary. The players and reviewers alike absolutely love it. And here's where my confusion arises. Because the Alan Wake 2 which I played was one of the most miserable experiences I have ever had with a video game. Where is this masterpiece everyone is talking about? What exactly is so great about it? You see the title, you see the length of the video, you clicked on it, so you know what's going to happen next. I'm going to break down this entire thing with no uncertain terms. I will show you the game, the story, the experience. By the end, you will know my pain. And just so we are clear, this video is not made to change anyone's mind. People like what they like, or pretend to like what they like, for as long as the honeymoon phase lasts until the next shiny new thing rolls around and everyone moves on to hyping the next current thing. That's the cycle of entertainment. That's the norm. No, this is not made for anyone to come to their senses, so to speak. Even when proven to be wrong, people refuse to accept the truth. It's just basic psychology. This is made for the ones who actually know next to nothing about the game, the person who hears people raving about it, people they might get their opinions from, people who influence their wallets and time. One of these professional gaming people, who you follow, loves this game. There is at least one. I guarantee it. They are idiots, or even worse, they are lying to you. You should stop listening to them. The following hours are my evidence, so sit back and enjoy, and remember, no matter what happens, no matter what I show on screen, always keep in mind that this is allegedly a 10 out of 10 game. We start as stories classically do, from the beginning, but first, a quick burst of context. Previously on Alan Wake. Alan Wake is a successful novelist from New York, who has recently been hit by a crippling case of writer's block. Together with his wife Alice, Alan makes a trip to the idyllic secluded town of Bright Falls to get away from all the stress and troubles. Weird things start to happen, Alice disappears, crazed townsfolk stalk the woodlands, and the literal embodiment of darkness is hunting Alan wherever he goes. It turns out, an eldritch horror known as the Dark Presence uses the nearby Cauldron Lake as its nest. It's always something. What is special about this entity is that it resonates with art, targeting creative folks and twisting their works into nightmares to unleash upon the world. It's not illusion, this is not psychological horror, this is actually happening. It's physical reality alteration, fueled and guided by art. The Dark Presence uses Alan's writing to grow stronger, with the goal of eventually engulfing everything in the world into the nightmare. In the end, Alan manages to defeat the Dark Presence, by essentially writing his own victory into the story. It's a combination of plot convenience, magical MacGuffins, and just good old fashioned shut the fuck up the hero wins. It's a mess, but anyway, the day is eventually saved. Peace returns to Bright Falls, 
Alice is saved. However, Alan himself is stuck inside the dark pocket dimension at the bottom of Cauldron Lake. Because that was the price he needed to pay in order to save everyone else. Because... Reasons? Drama? Bittersweet ending? Meta? In any case, that's where we are now. Alan is trapped in the dark place and is trying to get out. There are also two DLC episodes, which take the story nowhere. There's also a spin-off mini-sequel game, which also takes the story nowhere. Oh, and there's also an evil doppelganger of Alan manifested by the Dark Presence, called Mr. Scratch. That's it, all caught up. Except none of this matters, because apparently you do not need to play the first game to understand the second one. Because that sounds like an excellent idea. to a story. The story continues 13 years after the original as a man claws his way out of Cauldron Lake. Sohoy. So, in a bizarre turn of events, this highly anticipated sequel to a cult classic from a decade back, this action horror shooter adventure video game, the first thing it offers to the audience, the first task it asks from the player, is to stare at a bare naked lardy man ass for two whole minutes as they slowly guide this Humpty Dumpty through the woods. Well, guide is a tad generous description. The actual guiding comes from the game itself. It's a straight line, a hallway, masquerading as woods. There is no way to go wrong, no interaction of any kind, just hold the stick forward for two minutes. And there is also no way to speed up this process, even on repeated playthroughs, the game unlocks the ability to lightly jog only halfway through the trek. You can click on the button all you like, but the game refuses to let you move any faster until the tutorial prompt pops up. What is the player supposed to get out of this exercise? Why can't this sequence be a cutscene? In fact, it would work better as such. The only goal of this scene is to be quote-unquote spooky, a rando stranded in the woods. And since everything is strictly scripted, there is no reason to pretend like there is some element of interaction with the game, especially if the person holding the controller has ever played another video game in their life. They will instantly know that this scene won't carry any weight gameplay-wise, we aren't playing as either of the two protagonists, there are no combat mechanics introduced, there is no health bar, nothing indicates even the possibility of a fail state, the only immediate conclusion a thinking player can reach is, oh, this is a walking simulator, the game hasn't truly begun yet, everything is on autopilot, nothing I do matters here, and in a horror game, that is not a good state of mind to be in. <laughs> you enjoy that? Don't worry, we'll be getting plenty of that throughout the game. Oh, what a delight. Eventually, something happens. A bunch of creeps in deer masks emerge from the woods to chase the player's temporary chunky avatar. And here the player actually has two choices. They can either A, impotently try to lumber away, showcasing the fact that these guys are incapable of aiming their guns for shit. Embarrassing until they hit a script at the end and get stabbed. Or B, run straight into one of the enemies to get this crap over with. 
Either way, the game shifts into full cutscene mode. Again, this entire thing should have just been a cutscene. Nothing is gained from this two minute stretch of holding the control stick forward. It's fluff, fake gameplay, we'll be getting plenty of walking in the game to come, and by the time the credits roll, I don't believe anyone would finish the game thinking, yeah the game was fine and all, but it would have been a masterpiece if I got to roleplay as some ugly naked guy running through the woods. The scripted, unskippable sequences of slowly walking a character from one place to another are one of the great banes of modern video games. It's a misguided effort to try and merge the story and gameplay. Environmental storytelling has been a thing in video games since the inception of graphics. Even back when they couldn't be distinguished from sewage muck. Being in the world itself is part of the interactive experience. But the amount of time the player takes to absorb it all is their choice to make. They can take it slow and indulge every detail or they can rush through and focus on the hands-on tasks. The key point is that it's all up to the player. This kind of on-rails, forced, restrictive, walk slowly and smell the roses thing just reeks of insecurity from the developers. Look at it! Appreciate the effort we put into this environment! This is spooky! Now be spooked! I'm not hungry. <coughs> you heard the lady! Clean your plate! <laughs> Savor it! Let the flavors dance on your palate! This kind of pacing and non-existent gameplay misses the entire point of interactive media. In video games, the story won't progress unless the player succeeds in whatever task the game asks of them, continuing the story, the next step in the character's lives, it's all in the player's hands. That's the thing that separates video games from all other types of narrative art. However, in order to make this interaction between the player and the game valid, to have it mean something, the tasks the game gives to the player have to actually involve the player. There has to be the possibility of failure. It's a test. Bet you can't do this, says the game cheekily. Oh yeah? Well I'll show you, responds the player with eager defiance. There is no way to fail in holding the control stick up, unless the player is somehow severely disabled. At which point this game isn't really made for them in the first place. For comparison, the original Alan Wake started out with a quick combat section, core gameplay, right off the bat, just to establish what kind of experience the player is in for. Meanwhile, the opening gameplay of Alan Wake 2 is a big nothing burger. It may be inoffensive to people who are just happy to do whatever menial task while playing a game, especially at the beginning. After all, we are just starting out. Surely, the gameplay will ramp up going forth? Question mark? But for people who enjoy video games for the game part, first and foremost, this does nothing but cultivate resentment, especially on repeated playthroughs. You can skip cutscenes, but you can't skip this. And the player involvement in these scenes is so minuscule that they are just cutscenes without the label. Playing through this part, and much of the game as a whole, but we'll get to that in due time, is the exact same as if you were forced to constantly hold down the play button in order to watch this video. Who exactly would enjoy that? The story could have started right here, from the murder. Any intrigue or horror from this inciting incident would still be intact. And that way I wouldn't have to bleach my eyes.
So there's a raving murder cult terrorizing the woods around Bright Falls. And has been for 10 years now. Horrifying. And the FBI is called in to investigate. Naturally. Now the story truly starts out proper with the introduction of the main protagonist, Saga Anderson, as she talks with her daughter over the phone. I'm good, Mom. How are you? This trip might take a little longer than I thought. I'm sorry I've been gone so much lately, Logan. Oh my god, Mom, it's not your fault people get all murdery. What happened? Just work stuff. Right. The literal first thing we learn about the lead character is that her daughter treats death with the same level of reverence as Harley Quinn. Murdery? Love the callous energy there. Saga won't correct Logan, as a mother and a murder detective absolutely should. Sociopathy must run in the family, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The entire introduction chapter of the game is filled with this kind of dialogue. It's almost fascinating how horrid each interaction is. Every line and every character has this stilted, lame, uncanny, fake dialogue quality to them. No one talks like a normal person, no one has any charm, and nothing of interest is being said characterization-wise. Fucking nature gives me a headache. Too much sky. Attempts at humor call for cartoonishly dumb people to be present in this supposedly grounded story. So, the FBI, huh? That's so cool. Hunting down psycho serial killers and shootouts with the mob. You forgot the UFO cover ups. What? Those are real? You guys hiring? Oh, he's Let's just see this body, shall we? And this permeates throughout the entire game. It's just miserable listening to these twats. Have you heard of this cult of the tree, Sheriff? Only the urban legend. If you're in the woods at night, the cult will get you. That sort of thing. We're not gonna find out you're the Grand Wizard or something, are we? I played some D&D back in the day. The wizard was always my favorite class. All started with a big bang. The great highlight is when the FBI agents make contact with the local police. Hey there, Agent Casey, right? Sheriff Breaker said you'd be coming by to take over the case. You're half right. Anderson? Saga Anderson, I'll be leading this case. Seems you already know my partner, Alex Casey. <laughs> Sorry about that, ma'am. I'm Deputy Mulligan. I just figured that, you know, that, uh... Damn gonna show up, the federal agent's right here, Thornton. My partner Thornton, <laughs> down at the crime scene. He's not what you call the sharpest axe in the shed. Right here? What do you mean? Are they with you? Oh, shit! They didn't hear me, did they? This whole back and forth is horseshit. Casey handed the lead to Saga in the car. Unofficially. You should take lead. Think of me as the backup. Let's ignore the fact that this is not something that actually happens in law enforcement. You can't just decide to shift the chain of command. There is no way for the local cops to know Saga suddenly outranks Casey. Unofficially or not. And there's certainly no reason to apologize for this. Plus, Casey is the first to step forth. As in, he's taking charge. This dialogue is forced, and for many people, this kind of interaction will immediately ignite alarm bells. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. The only reason for this contrived scenario is to play Saga front and center, and give her the chance to correct the stupid local bumpkin, drive in the point that she is in fact in charge, and people better deal with it. Hey Casey. You putting me in charge. Why now? Look, Anderson, you're a better detective than I am. You've cracked cases that had the rest of us baffled. I don't want to slow you down. Laying it extra thick right from the start. Telling, not showing. The protagonist is so awesome, you should like her, because she is so awesome. Any idea who the victim is? Oh, I sure do. 
His name is Nightingale. He was FBI. He came to town about 13 years ago. Now, I haven't heard a word about him since. Well, until now. Nightingale? Robert Nightingale? Oh, yes. You probably knew him. Brothers in arms. Oh, and sisters. Nightingale would still be a brother in arms to Saga. The term is brothers in arms, you preposterous pine cones. Stop this nonsense. We know Saga is a woman, no one talks like this. At this point I already want to just mute everyone and get to the actual gameplay 10 minutes in. As it turns out, the murder victim is actually someone we know. The we being people who have played the previous game. Nightingale was this antagonistic, obsessive, completely insane FBI agent, hell-bent on arresting Alan, because he believed the writer to be behind the chaos, which he was, in part. And now he's here, emerging from Cauldron Lake, which makes no sense in terms of continuity. He was implied to be dead, eviscerated by the Dark Presence, until he wasn't, as seen here, as he menacingly glares at the happy ending scene, very much in the real world, but apparently not. Instead, the Dark Presence stuffed Nightingale back inside its cheek for safekeeping, and now, 13 years later, suddenly decided to spit him out again? Why? And how exactly did the local police ID Nightingale? Usually one would use dental records or something like that but the body hasn't been examined yet. The story tries to establish continuity, create a bridge between the games, yet ends up blowing it up instead. Always a sign of solid priorities. It's a reference, and that's all that matters. Since this is a murder investigation, the player is tasked to gather evidence, and this is where the game introduces its great innovation, the mind place. The mind place. My version of the mind palace technique. To sift through clues and work the case. Building the mind place again for each case. Using each field office as a model in my head. Okay, so this is basically a menu screen contextualized as Saga's mind. All the evidence, files and other knickknacks Saga collects get recorded here. And the player can freely walk around the different stations and skim through them. A bit indulgent for something so simple, especially since the player is given the option to just browse between classic submenus like any other video game, but whatever. I'm sure this concept won't be any source of great annoyance throughout the game. So here's how the investigation works. The player collects all the highlighted objects from the environment. Saga comments on them. Then, the player has to go to the mind place, place the clues up on the case board, and Saga comments on them again. This has to be done manually for each clue. Place them in the predetermined correct spot on the board. There is no challenge. You don't even have to read what each clue is and try to match the correct category. You can just hammer them wherever on repeat until you find the correct spot. What the hell is the point of this? There's no effort required from the player. The story and investigation are all on rails. The player doesn't have to piece the case together, deduce anything, or put the information they've gathered to use elsewhere. Saga solves the case herself. This is not Ace Attorney where the player needs to familiarize themselves with the details of the case in order to succeed. That game is completely built around the logic puzzle of who done it and how. The story won't advance if the player doesn't figure out each step of the case themselves. Furthermore, the game leaves it up to the player to examine and determine the value of each piece of evidence and to use them in the correct situation. The case board in Alan Wake 2 is a glorified quest log, which the player has to fill up themselves by dragging photos across the screen to a pre-marked spot. 
How is this gameplay? This is the definition of busy work. In any other game, the information would be automatically filed neatly in a list and the player could reference it at their leisure. Exactly like the game itself does with every other type of collectible. And this would not be a major issue if the game didn't force the use of the board at every turn. The game literally won't progress until the player places the clues they've gathered up on the board. Well, sometimes. There are several points in the game where the player can in fact complete a task, go to the case board, and all the clues related to the event are automatically added in. Why couldn't this all be automated? Since the function is already coded in the game. All it does is waste the player's time. There's no way to know which tasks are completable without the case board and which are locked until the clues are dragged in place. Here's one of the worst offenders. In chapter 3, the player is tasked with tracking down several items across a tiny amusement park area. Here I am, right in front of one of the objects, the circuit board from a carnival ride. I'm looking right at it, yet the prompt to pick it up won't spawn. I'm forced to go to the case board, fill in the clues, which Saga is already aware of story-wise, mind you. And only then, only after doing this useless busy work, the game allows me to pick up the item. This is horrendous. This alone makes me paranoid about the board. I can't skip anything. I have to use it after every single clue. Drag all the little pictures in their correct place so that I'm allowed the privilege to actually play this horror action survival shooter like any other normal video game. How could anyone think this is acceptable? Why would anyone subject the player to this garbage? Tervetuloa muun muassa mies Alan Wakein takaa Remedy peliyhtiön luova johtaja Sami Järvi. Kiitos paljon. No, me ollaan, me ollaan hirveän paljon näin isoon peliin nähden niin panostettu nimenomaan interaktiivisen tarinankerrontaan ää, siihen, että miten me keksitään tapoja, joilla se pel- pelaaja osallistuu sen, sen ikään kuin tarinan työstämiseen ja edistämiseen. Et tässä on tämmöinen, meillä on kaksi pelattavaa hahmoa, meillä on Alan Wake kirjailija ja sitten meillä on ää, FBI-agentti Saga Anderson ja peli alkaa murha tutkimuksella, kun FBI tulee pikkukaupunkiin tutkimaan, tutkimaan murhia, niin pelaaja pääsee ihan tähän ikään kuin etsivän rooliin, etsimään vihjeitä ja, ja tota niin, ää, on ihan tämmöinen just leffoista ja telkkarisarjoista tuttu, tuttu tota niin, ää, taulu, johon sitten punaisella langalla yhdistetään, yhdistetään vihjeitä. Ja... Sam, Sami. I'm not quite ready to unleash the full verbal barrage this miserable puzzle masquerading as a video game deserves, so I'm going to approach this with an example. You are probably aware of this game, good old Super Mario Bros. If the player doesn't complete the levels, doesn't clear the jumps, doesn't defeat Bowser, if the player does not succeed in the task given to them by the game, They can't save the fair princess in trouble. There's a good direct way to involve the player in the story. There are also these things called RPGs. Role-playing games. Where the player gets to make these things called decisions. Which influence the direction the story will take. People may die. Wars may ignite. Souls may be saved or forsaken. The world may be a completely different place by the end, depending on the player's actions. And what's that saga is carrying there? Oh, it is a gun! And as most people know, unloading a firearm into the face of a raving murder nut is an exceedingly effective way not to end up six feet under yourself. The story will literally stop 
if the player fails to shoot the enemy in the face. Is that not enough involvement from the player in the story? This is not involving the player in any meaningful way. This is a useless, boring chore the player is forced to complete again and again in between each part of the actual game. It's yet another form of unskippable cutscene, and at this point, the story is already starting to fall apart, so the less worthless crap there is to bog down the progress, the better. Profiling. Get into the subject's head. See what they saw. Oh, for fuck's sake. Agent Nightingale has been MIA for 13 years. How did he end up here? Up from the lake that's not a lake. It's dark. He was there too. You are not allowed in the lake until he says otherwise. Robert Nightingale came from the lake before his murder. Certainly most of you are reeling from some variety of what the actual hell was that. So I'll do my best to explain. As it turns out, Saga is a seer. She can literally summon ghosts of the past, or sometimes just see into the past outright. That way she can just know things no one should reasonably be able to know. This is the most blatant, ridiculous, pathetic, embarrassing Deus Ex Machina Marisu power I've ever seen in any piece of fiction. There is no longer any point to the investigation. Saga can just ask the past to reveal anything she needs. She can target anyone at any time. The target can be living or dead. There are no stated limitations. The case should be over right here and now. Simply profile every person in town, every past victim, and find out who the cultists are. And yet, Saga refuses to do this. This utterly bizarre mechanic, both in terms of gameplay and narrative, is simply a lazy way for the writers to give Saga the exact information she needs at any specific moment so that the story will move to the exact direction they want. This is the worst written detective story anyone has ever created. Saga is an idiot, and the writers are bigger idiots. There is no reason to care anymore, it's done. In storytelling, you always place your best foot forward. You do not start out by treating the audience like fucking morons. Anyone capable of more complex thought than that of a lemming should immediately realize that this story element is absurd and needs to be thrown in the trash. I swear, professional writing nowadays is all just a race to the bottom to see who can decimate their world building and audience investment in the least amount of time. And just to pile on stupid over stupid, jumping ahead about halfway through the game, it is revealed that Saga is in fact not aware of her ability. She thinks that she has super intuition instead of being psychic ghost whisperer. The truth about her having supernatural powers is revealed to her by her relatives, who all possess this ability too. Because apparently, Saga thinks that seeing visions of Casper the obese ghost who gives her information about an active murder investigation is a normal everyday occurrence. And of course, the profiling carries all the same issues as the case board. You have to do it, otherwise the game won't progress. You have to individually click through this list of inquiries and play a separate vision for each of them. Look at the same animation of Saga staring into the void, tilting her head, instead of the game just playing all these forced cutscenes automatically and getting it over with. More busy work, click the buttons, that's involving the player, so says the visionary game director Sami Järvi. 
everything having to do with investigation in this game is bullshit pretending to be gameplay. So following the hints from a ghost, the FBI agents track down Nightingale steps towards the lake and stumble across yet another supernatural clue. A page full of text on one side. Not a printout. Written with a typewriter. Old school. Lines scratched out and edits added with a pen. Mm-hmm, like a manuscript. Page of a story. Mm, Killing left a message. It's for us. The text is about us. The victim was one of their own. FBI Special Agent Robert Nightingale. And then there was a page they found. The first step down into terrifying depths. Reading, reading words. These words are like a message. Like a message. Someone knew they were here. Someone playing a game with them. An invitation. How could they not accept? Even if they knew they were hurting them. Someone's been watching us. Playing a sick game with us. It seems like history carries a rhyme. Mr. Wake is stuck in the dark place, writing a horror story, which affects reality, in an effort to eventually type his way free from the nightmare realm. And on top of that, he has also integrated Saga to be the new protagonist of his latest tale. Saga obviously doesn't know that yet, how could she? Ask phantoms. But that is in fact what's going on. That's the literal premise of the story. Anyway, the agents head to town to continue their investigation. Bright Falls is the centerpiece of the whole Alan Wake series. It's the most important location in the game. The quiet, unassuming backwater town tormented by supernatural horrors. A lame ripoff or homage to horror classics depending on your point of view. In any case, this community and the lives of every person unfortunate enough to live here are the stakes of this tale. The darkness from the lake will swallow and corrupt every soul it can reach. And it will start from the local folk. The game is all about the battle to save people from this grim fate. And so I present to you just how much effort and love and care Remedy has put into making this location the most detailed and interesting and immersive place they possibly can. Enjoy! I'm gonna go check something out. Be right back. Got it.
what? Half a minute beverages you don't have anything to do with it? I don't know what you're talking about. And this is not cherry picking. There are a couple dozen NPCs in the entire game total, and all of them look and act like retarded mollusks. There is no excuse for this. This is not a massive RPG with hundreds of characters and endless hours of content and things to see. The town is a literal square circling a couple of buildings. There is nothing here. You should be able to polish this minuscule amount of content to perfection. The NPCs and world in Majora's Mask had more life to them, and that was released back in 2000, and made in a year. It also has more content, better gameplay, better puzzles, better exploration, and a better story about Nightmare's existential threat. Actually, fuck this, I'm gonna go play Majora instead. Three days later. If this is the best you can do, just give up. Don't have areas the player can freely poke at, You'll save yourself the embarrassment, and save my immersion as well. I have no desire to spend time in this world. It's a perfect valley of the uncanny. Not to mention every single person has been whacked with an ugly stick. Or rather had a car accident involving a truckload of ugly logs. Let the darkness swallow this universe. Erase it. It's not worth fighting for. <laughs> to be fair, the game can occasionally look impressive. The lighting of Remedy's Northlight engine is robust, which is another way to say they made a nice looking skybox. Congrats. As if every AAA release in the past 10 years isn't capable of this exact same sunset vista. How about next time putting some money and effort into making the humans look human? That would be swell. Going for ultra realism in art direction is fundamentally a fool's errand for video games. Every game that tries to look like a Hollywood movie will look dated in a few years. Technology advances fast, it's impossible to keep up. Motion capture is still not fully convincing, people look like skin puppets. Even the main cast, with the most care put into them, the longer you look at them, the creepier they become. Best decision has been, and always will be, to go for stylized graphics. The more distinct the style, the better. Those are the definition of timeless. Disney cartoons from the 1940s still look gorgeous today. Same thing. If you do something unique and distinct, it will be that exact same unique and distinct. No matter how much time passes. Or you can go the remedy route and completely wipe out any shred of immersion the player might have by producing half the cutscenes in live action. This is the most idiotic thing they could have possibly done. It only further underlines the fact that the rest of the game looks uncanny. It is impossible to meet the game halfway and accept the technical limitations and try to be immersed when the game itself reminds me that this is not what reality is supposed to look like. This is what a human looks like, not this. So at this point I'm already checking out from the narrative side of the game. The characters are boring, or annoying, or a combination of both. The dialogue is ass, the murder investigation is a joke, the world does not feel immersive, there's nothing to be invested in, it's just misery, 20 minutes in. The only hope at this point is that all this setup will soon be over and the actual game will finally begin and I can start hunting shadow folk in the woods like back in the good old days. In the meantime, there's still a ton of asinine storytelling to labor through. First up is interrogating the witnesses to the murder. A couple of campers out of town saw the whole thing and are held at the local diner instead of the police station. Where there's privacy? No, no, Saga just talks about the gruesome murder with the witnesses, out in the open, in the middle of a crowded diner, and no one reacts to this. How can you write a police procedure drama and not give a single fuck about the actual procedure or drama? No one acts like a human being in this universe. So are we being charged with anything? Because if not, we'd love to get back to our hotel and decompress after what we saw. Take a bath, screw into pillows, that kind of thing. Well, 
excuse me, princess. If you use the term decompress, you literally do not have to decompress. Oh, and then we found out. The whole thing was terrifying. And the witnesses apparently stole something from the crime scene. And instead of just demanding them to hand it over, Saga uses her magic bullshit talk to the past powers so that she knows exactly what they took and then demands them to hand it over. You do not have to do any of this. Just arrest them, search them, demand them to turn out their pockets. You have all the authority to do so. You are part of the FBI and at this point, the witnesses are suspects of a crime too, you miserable fake person. A necklace these cultists may have dropped. Okay. Wow. How did you put that together? It's evidence. You need to hand it over. Savor that, because that's the only time anyone questions Saga's abilities. This idiocy leads to nothing, there's no new info added, the trinket means nothing, it's just more stupid shit into the pile, waste of time. The real narrative reason for all of this is to get Saga inside the diner, so that this can happen. Saga! Saga Anderson, as I live and breathe. I thought we'd never see you back here after that awful, awful thing happened to your baby girl. Sorry. Who are you? I don't know what you're talking about. It's me, silly. Rose. You know me. I don't think I do. And what horrible thing happened to my baby girl? She drowned. Your daughter. That's so weird you don't remember. How do you know I have a daughter? You're blocking out your traumatic memories. Happens on TV all the time. No. You're mistaking me for someone else. <laughs> if you say so. Okay, so putting aside the abysmal alien way of speaking, because that's already the norm, some random bitch tells you that your kid is dead My boy. and you already know that someone is fucking with you personally from the manuscript page and you are basically just gonna let this slide. You don't call your daughter, make sure she is safe. You don't probe anything further from Rose, see if she lets any more details slip, something that might directly incriminate her of conspiracy. You don't use your Ghost Whisperer superpowers to find out the truth instantly. And the only thing you do question is how she knew your name. As if you didn't just announce your name loudly right next to the counter where she works. What a masterful detective you are. Let's not beat around the bush. I'm just going to explain what's going on here. The horror story Alan is writing is altering reality and Saga's history in such a way that her daughter is in fact dead. Everyone around her will slowly be affected by this, and their perception of history, their memory, will be rewritten to match. Casey is the most obvious example. He starts out by bantering with Saga after she ends the call with Logan, as in, she is alive in his mind. And by the end of the game, his memory is altered and he implores Saga to accept the truth of her daughter's death. That's the basic gist of it. No idea why Alan, or anyone else who might be writing the story, <laughs> wants or needs Saga's daughter to be dead, but that's how it is. It also calls to question just how powerful the Dark Place's influence actually is on the real world. Suddenly it can alter reality even outside Bright Falls. But that's the same kind of question as with the Ghost Whisperer powers. The writers, not Alan, the actual writers of the game, want these specific things to happen. 
So they are just going to happen. The audience is not supposed to think, just consume, listen to the horrid dialogue, do some brain dead tasks, walk slowly through town with the NPCs, so that they can take part in more horrid dialogue and more brain dead tasks. This is what modern gaming is all about. And speaking of wanting to commit seppuku, the coroner is out of town, and we still need to do a proper autopsy. Quite the pickle, eh? No worries, Saga can do it herself. Of course she can. She can do anything. Just ignore the fact that the job of a detective and the job of a coroner are completely separate. Also ignore all the legal issues with this. An official autopsy has to be done by a licensed medical professional, otherwise none of the evidence collected will be admissible in court. You are planning on actually prosecuting someone for these crimes, are you not? No, I don't like this, David. No, that's enough. And she performs the autopsy without gloves. Are you shitting me? Saga is actively sabotaging the case, and everyone just lets her do it. I know some of you people are allergic to condoms, but if you can't handle latex, then do not work on fields that require the use of latex. It's that simple. So anyway, Saga finds yet another manuscript page inside Nightingale, and absolutely everything goes to shit. The Taken could not see into bright light. Light hurt them, made them vulnerable. Nightingale had no heart, but here he was. Killing. Someone's created a fucked up fantasy about us. Hey, hold on. We found these kinds of pages. I didn't think they were relevant to this case. I have them right here. My gun's out in the hall. Gotta get it back. Shoot the chunky zombie a grand total of twice, he teleports away, and the chapter ends. Well, that was horrible. Can I just play the game now? The door won't open. It's not locked. I know it's not locked. The game just won't allow me to leave. 
I have to use the fucking stupid case board to trigger the next story sequence. And look at this, the game has to rip camera control away from the player so that Tweedledum and Tweedledwat can spawn in off screen and open the door. This game is so on rails, I feel like Thomas the goddamn tank engine! And this was the moment where my investment in anything in this game got eradicated into atoms. Stupid, after stupid, after stupid. But this... This was just insanity. We heard gunshots, y'all okay? Did you get spooked by the bodies? Sheriff Breaker disappeared. Nightingale turned into some sort of a monster and there are offices down. You two handle things here. We need to get back to Cauldron Lake immediately. Fuck me. That's terrible. But we'll do what we can, man. The dumbass duo see a dead body. One of their colleagues... The only path out of the morgue is the doorway they just came through. The only people alive after whatever just happened are the two FBI agents. And they immediately start spinning some ridiculous story that sounds like the ravings of a mad lad. Nightingale turned into a monster. So where is he now? Teleported? Magic does not exist, as far as anyone here understands the world. This is a literal closed room murder case, and Saga and Casey are the only obvious suspects. And what happens next? The local police let them go, without questioning anything. These people are not humans. Everyone in this game's universe is a meat puppet controlled by space lizards. That's the only way any of this computes. And let's just listen to that delivery again. Fuck me. That's terrible. That's terrible. That's terrible. Absolutely incredible. That's crazy talk. Monsters aren't real and... What do you mean, the, the sheriff disappeared? Like poof? He's gone like magic? Magic's not real! Magic's not real. Right. Mulligan, no Thorn. Monsters aren't real, and magic's definitely not real. <laughs> Knew that. Yes! Yes, you idiots! Arrest them! Far as you know, Saga is obviously lying, you absolute waste of air! What the fuck is this shit? My clients have been held here long enough. Are you gonna let me speak to them or not? Uh, just a moment, ma'am. Someone will be right with you. The sheriff has disappeared, shots fired downstairs, there is a dead officer at the morgue, and the rest of the station doesn't care. Life goes on as if nothing ever happened. Nightingale and his cult are dangerous. We need to be prepared in case things escalate more than they already have. Can you call it in, Casey? A smart choice, Anderson. Why haven't you done that already? Not that it matters. The backup never arrives. We need backup. The Bright Falls case... Whoever you can spare, ASAP. Think we'll actually find Nightingale at the lake? The pages haven't been wrong yet. We can't assume the person writing these pages isn't playing us. I agree. But it's our best lead. You know, you can hurry if you want. I'm gonna take a quick look around. Meet you back at the car. See you in a bit. What? No! I'm heading to the car! See? Uh, rinse and repeat. Clock out, get a beer. Or maybe three. 
Did you check out the town, Anderson? Just getting my bearings. Ready to go? Waiting on you. The moment the player does anything except follow the script precisely, the game shits itself on the spot. Magic's not real! Like poof! There's the car, so where's the deputy? I think I hear someone. Hey, over here! Hey there! H and KC, right? Sheriff Breaker said you'd be coming by to take over the case. You're half right. Anderson? Saga Anderson. Deal with it! A full hour into the game, and we are finally at the cusp of the actual video game part of this video game. But before we move too far from the previous scene, you know the scene we just witnessed a couple minutes ago, all the horror and chaos and people dying around us. Let's hear from Saga and find out what she thinks about all this. This case just keeps getting weirder, but it is exciting. People are dropping like flies, there is a teleporting murder zombie on the loose, the lives of an entire town full of people are in imminent danger, and Saga thinks this is exciting. What are you retarded? You are an adult woman, an FBI agent, a homicide detective specifically. Stop with this happy-go-lucky act, you despicable psychopath. And since I'm already teed up, let's drive this thing home for good. Saga Anderson is one of the most awful leads to ever exist in any piece of fiction. She is insufferable, idiotic, self-centered, callous plank of wood, gifted with ridiculous magical Marisu powers to ensure her success. As an FBI agent, she is completely worthless. Her brilliant plan to track down the teleporting zombie is to go to the dark woods in the dead of night and immediately split up from her partner, oh wait, no, back up, my mistake, at no point in the story does she actually figure out anything, she never uses clever logical deduction to combine clues, or sneaky questions to make suspects reveal more than they intend, it's all done by her ghost whispering, or if not that, she is given directions by the equally magical manuscript pages, such as right here. The only reason she knows to come back to Cauldron Lake is that the pages literally told her, as they also told her to find Nightingale's heart, which also teleported alongside him and ended up in a cooler inside an abandoned convenience store, and the heart opens a pathway to another dimension when combined with a billboard. What the fuck is this script? This is literally, and then this happens, story. What kind of self-respecting writer would ever allow this kind of travesty escape their pen? It's not terrifying, it's not mysterious, it's not interesting, it's just dumb. This is Discount Silent Hill, and we already have Discount Silent Hill. We do not need Discount Silent Hill of Discount Silent Hill. Nyt kansainvälisissä medioissa on myöskin aika laajasti arvosteltu tätä uutta osaa ja, ja siellä on nyt voittopuolisesti kyllä tosi hehkuttavaa palautetta tullut näissä arvioissa niin suomalaismedioissa kuin kansainvälisissäkin. Jos mä parjaan tässä siteerä, niin poliikon suitsuttaa, että peli on jokaisen minuutin arvoinen 13 vuoden odotuksesta ja ikään kehu nimenomaan tätä tarinaa rohkeammaksi sitten Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill. Out your fucking mouth! The case board is smoke and mirrors, trying to convince the audience as if there's anything going on in Saga's cobweb infested brain. But all she ever manages to gurgle out of her muncher is the most obvious thing imaginable. She is an awful detective and barely functions as a human being. Well, now there's less monsters. She said with smile in her voice. 
Those were people once. Oh my god, mom, murdery. Moreover, gleefully callous psychopathy aside, Saga has this narcissistic tendency to turn any topic imaginable to be all about herself. This whole mountain used to be an active volcano. Imagine the force it took to carve this crater out of the earth. Caldera is a pretty rare, so be sure to take it in. So, essentially, we're standing in the gaping maw of hell. You got it. I used to love geology when I was in school. I helped Logan build a great baking soda volcano for her science fair. Cheating on a science fair? That's almost a crime, Anderson. I'm not gonna say no to quality time with a volcano. I mean, my daughter. She just loves the science. She's a modern, strong, independent, educated, empowered woman after all. Of course she just loves the science. Mom's family was from Sweden. I've always imagined it kind of like this. Saunas, lakes, seems nice. If you actually cared about Scandinavia, you would have already visited. Perhaps if people started murdering each other a bit more, it would be more exciting and worth a trip. You don't care about your roots as anything more than aesthetic. Go fuck yourself, you sad poser. And just like every modern video game protagonist it seems, Saga is incapable of shutting the fuck up. There's another lunchbox. A lunchbox again. Another one of those lunchboxes. A locked box. The cult is leaving supplies around for themselves. Wonder what's inside. Another one of those cult boxes. Another cult box. Another locked box. As if the player moving the camera is somehow incapable of seeing it themselves. And then there's just utterly bizarre things. Such as Saga's apparent obsession with hunting trophies scattered across the game. Without fail, she has to pet each and every one of them. Except this is something you should never, ever do. Because of the toxic chemicals used in taxidermy. Seriously, do not do this. Maybe this actually explains the brain rot, both in and outside the fiction. Bottom line, Saga sucks in every way imaginable, she is miserable company, and every moment I'm forced to spend with this deranged pint is another byline in the suicide note people will find by the time I'm done with this travesty. The tracks lead into the water. Where did you Can you stop that? The dark gloomy woods are not enough. The crazed axe murderers controlled by eldritch forces are not enough. The hulking zombie is not enough. At every conceivable opportunity, the game has to throw flashing images on the screen. Ugudi boogudi. Just to make sure the player is sufficiently aware that this is a horror game and they should be spooked. Jump scares are the lowest, lamest, most pathetic tactic horror has at its disposal. It's not an accomplishment to make someone twitch with sudden loud noises and movements. It's hardwired into our brains. It's a part of normal fight or flight response. It doesn't even matter what you- <laughs> You can show anything to make people flinch. It is absurd that adult people trying to craft an atmosphere of dread are still relying on this stupid gimmick. But I guess Five Nights at Freddy's is super popular, so there you go. And the game is riddled with these, they happen constantly, and they make no sense. They are not enemies catching you off guard, you don't have to react to any type of threat, it's just sputtery faces screeching at you, the game essentially goes boo, and expects you to be impressed. It becomes tiresome at the start of the game, the second time this happens, and they only get more annoying as the game goes on. Even if you are someone who's extra receptible to being spooked, this game makes you numb. Fast. And the startles always happen at the exact same spots, which steals any impact they could even theoretically have on repeat playthroughs. In fact, they are so scripted that I got a flash inside a save room. 
See, I'm supposed to follow Tweedle Twat here, through the woods, get jump scared, but like an intelligent gamer, I go save my progress when given the opportunity. The game wants to jump me, right now, and so it does, whether or not I'm inside a safe zone, within the light. The one weakness the forces of darkness are supposed to have in this universe. This one actually made me laugh, I was so bored and done with the game already. The apex of lazy is chapter 5, where no joke, within 40 minutes of playing the game, there are 10 jump scares. The same dusty hag spurging at the screen. Two of these happen literally seconds from each other. This is the game design equivalent of having a micro penis, being self-conscious about it, buying the biggest, loudest car possible to compensate, while failing to realize it's a wow. mobile. Christ. How many enemies do you think are in this first proper combat chapter of the game? How much core gameplay do we get? Come on, guess! Type it in the comments if you are so inclined. The answer is 4. Tutorial guy, 2 extra randos and the boss. Then it's back to story time. This game is bizarre when it comes to pacing, and we'll dissect that at a later point. For now, let's examine the combat itself. It's been 13 years since the previous game, Remedy has created two separate third-person shooter adventures in the meantime. Surely, they have learned so much and are just itching to harness all their cumulative skill and innovation to make the second Alan Wake the best experience it can be. Right? For comparison, a quick explanation of the core mechanics of Alan Wake. The combat in the first game forms around one central gimmick. Every enemy in the game is shielded by aura of darkness that makes them impervious to gunfire. The player is required to use their flashlight to purge the darkness, and make the enemies vulnerable. The light also has a secondary function of stunning enemies. Aiming is nearly automated with a generous aim assist. Just point the flashlight in the general direction and pull the trigger. It's simple, even simplistic, but the game works as intended. For the most part. The dodge command, for example, is highly iffy. The dodge doesn't actually give the player any iframes, but rather functions as a lunge to the side. The player has to actually avoid the attack, not dodge through them. There's also significant recovery time between each dodge. No Dark Souls dodge roll spamming here. The player is incentivized to go for perfect dodges, indicated with a slow-mo effect. The big issue is that for whatever reason the dodge timing is unreliable, Many times attacks that should not hit the player end up connecting anyway. The dodge simply does not activate, no matter how much the player hammers the button. Combine this with the brilliant decision of having enemies occasionally spawn literally out of nowhere, and you got yourself some world-class jank. The gameplay never evolves further from this, enemies are samey throughout, there's only a handful of weapons, and the level design is largely a bunch of identical woods and scattered buildings. It all becomes tiresome across the 8 hour campaign. The one thing to reasonably assume from Remedy after over a decade has passed, after creating two separate IPs, both of them shooters, is that Alan Wake 2 would be a marked improvement, or at least equal to its predecessor, Instead, it's a strict downgrade in every way imaginable. First of all, the flashlight, the defining mechanic of Alan Wake. In the first game, the flashlight use was limited only by its battery, represented as one solid meter. The player can use as little or much as they like at any given moment, 
and if they happen to run out, they can switch out the battery for a new one and continue flashing, specifically only the direct combat use of flashlight or boosting drains the battery. Additionally, the current battery slowly regenerates if not boosting, which means that the player can save up their batteries by playing around this. Replacing the battery from the limited surplus is a choice the player can make as an emergency option, but it's all in the player's hands. It's a tiny bit of strategizing and gameplay complexity, something the game desperately needs. In Alan Wake 2, all of that is gone. Here, the battery life is represented by charges, instead of one solid meter. The idea is that each fresh battery can be boosted a predetermined number of times, and each boost strips a single enemy from the darkness shield. If there are four charges in the battery, the player can disrupt four enemy shields. The current battery also no longer refills automatically, the battery life is turned into another type of ammo, essentially. This change leads into several gameplay ramifications. The worst is the boosting itself. The player can no longer boost, stop boosting, move and keep on boosting from a different position. Now, once the player initiates the boost, they are locked into an animation lasting several seconds after which the enemy shield breaks. That is, in theory, the problem is that the boosting animation is bonked. Even with the game's generous auto-aim, sometimes the boosting inexplicably fails. This is 100% on the game. It sometimes just has a bitch fit and refuses to cooperate. The light does not connect properly, triggering only partial damage to the shield. Now what this means is that the player has just wasted an entire charge, since they have to activate a second boost to remove the shield. Another whole charge on a single enemy. This issue would not exist if the game had just copied its flashlight from the previous game. If a game with any kind of resource management steals away resources from the player because of no fault of their own, that is inexcusable. This mechanic does not function as it should. And that is only half the issue. Even when the game functions as intended, the way the battery works feels wrong. Whenever the player uses up the final charge of the current battery, the game forces them to switch the battery immediately. They cannot refuse. The game instantly goes into the switching animation on the spot. This means that the player is robbed of several vital seconds of firing at the enemy, since after losing their shield, the enemies stumble for a moment. That's the moment to strike. The decision to reload the flashlight should be handled the same way as the choice of reloading the weapons. The player does it when appropriate. As it currently is, the game consistently fucks the player over in every single encounter. Additionally, several obvious features from the first game are just gone. The player can no longer drain multiple enemies' armors in unison, nor can they point their unboosted flashlight at the enemy to chip away at them. There's also no opportunities to combine the effects of several light sources, heavy duty lights, gas canisters, all gone. These were small cheeky tactics the player could use to dominate the enemies faster, and they once again added needed depth to the gameplay. Now, what little flow and dynamism the combat in the first game had is eradicated. Everything is stiff and restrictive. As for shooting itself, the game has assumed the exact same type of gunplay as Resident Evil 4 Remake released prior the same year. The player is required to pace their shots and allow the aiming reticle to tighten or risk their shots flying off into the woods. The area inside the crosshair represents the game's RNG. Each shot lands somewhere inside it. 
This kind of aiming is cancer. Give us a proper objective crosshair. Let the player aim and shoot. This RNG penalty for firing too fast is idiotic. It makes no sense. A trained person can unload their pistol in a matter of seconds with reasonable accuracy. Here, you can stand at point-blank range with your rifle and miss due to the game mechanics sucking skunk anus. This is solely done to make simple combat artificially harder. And this exact single decision also made Resident Evil 4 Remake objectively inferior product to the original. And every problem from the first game carries over to the new one, Amplified. The dodge is even worse here. Half the time it simply does not move the player far enough from the attack, and the timing for perfect dodge is way too strict in a game designed around close encounters. In the previous game, there was always vastly more space to maneuver, and Alan was more nimble on his feet. Still clumsy, the sprinting especially was pathetic, but it was nowhere near as horrendously slow as the second game. The player character physics all around are made much more rigid, and combined with the unreliable dodge, and the camera that has been zoomed in way too close... Surprise, motherfucker! ...just makes the combat an absolute slog. For a single substantial new combat element, the game introduces weak points to the enemies. Every so often, the enemies sprout these glowing fuck me spots, shoot them for extra damage, simple enough. Except this is completely wasted. Think about it. It's a small round blister across the chest. Aiming for it is no more demanding than going for the head. Why not just keep the head as the sole weak point? This adds nothing to the game. And sometimes the weak point can manifest on the enemy's backside. At which point you are not hitting it. Forget it, it's over. Just pop the head and be done with it. Merely mentioning the existence of dead space is enough here. As for the enemies themselves, they come in two varieties. They are either basic and inoffensive, or absolute sins against the very concept of game design. In a game where the player character moves as if carrying cinder block shoes, you cannot, I repeat, you cannot add in enemies that dash around super fast and attack from afar by throwing axes at you. That is a recipe for disaster. It's a basic rule of enemy design, you either make them tanky, you make them fast, or you give them ranged attacks. One of the above, not all of them at once. And these are not rare, the game spams these wankers everywhere. They originate from the first game, and they were annoying there as well, but because the flow of combat has changed entirely, now they are pure misery. Especially since they can rip themselves free from the boosting animation, which means even more resources wasted. Similar scorn towards the wolves. Apparently the people of Pride Falls have not been culling their wolf population over the last 13 years. There's tons of them, just strutting about a hundred meters from town. I say it again, fast enemies running around the player combined with these kinds of sluggish controls is a nightmare to play. And just to annoy me personally in every conceivable way, the damage and stagger on enemies is infuriatingly inconsistent. You can shotgun a wolf in the face, and they just keep going. Sometimes. Other instances, a single blast ends them. As it should. Other enemies are serviceable, there's the basic MOOC, big dudes with Giga Chonker weapons, they have more HP, because being fat means bullets do less harm to you, that's a stated law of video games somewhere, I'm sure. Then there are these wibbly wobbly poltergeist mirror enemies, they take decent punishment, they move slow, sometimes they disappear and try to grab the player, or toss waves of dark magic -y water? And yes, that's it. The game has a grand total of five enemy types. 
And it wouldn't be as bad if the scenarios built around the roster of foes were interesting and varied. But the whole game has exactly one setup to overcome. Enemies march towards the player, from the front, and get annihilated. The first game had multiple special scenarios to spice up the gameplay. At one point you have to make do with only flash grenades. At one point you handle the flashlight while an NPC shoots the enemies. At one point you have to escape enemies using only a flashlight. There are several driving sections where you can just let loose and squish everyone. There's a turret section with a giant spotlight. Yes, this was indeed released in 2010. And most of these sections weren't exactly something other developers should copy their homework from. At best they were serviceable. But at least there was a clear effort being made to vary the gameplay and to test the player in different ways. Comparatively the second game's campaign is painfully dull. On the whole, the combat is not interesting, it's not fun, it's not even challenging. The footage you see here is from my second playthrough, on hard. The game is a cakewalk from beginning to end. Any trouble the player might have is created by broken mechanics coming together to screw them. And once the player knows how to play around the jank, the game breaks in a different way. A perfect example, the first boss. Nightingale goes down in mere moments if the player handles the encounter correctly. The first instinct may be to keep one's distance. After all, the man is carrying a chunky piece of wood. But at that point, the boss can suddenly teleport towards the player and attack right away, leaving the player at the mercy of the clunky dodge. The boss also has the ability to slam his weapon to the ground, which creates shockwaves that are near impossible to see in the dark. The best strategy is to ignore dodging, close in, go ham with everything you have, at which point the boss teleports to its next position. And just to ramp up the tension, the boss is given jump scare grabs in between phases, really going for the laziest bottom of the barrel tactics to spook the player. Anyway, the boss falls easy, once the player realizes not to treat the encounter as a back and forth against a powerful supernatural entity, but rather a one-sided slam fest against a growling punching bag. It's actually embarrassing, there's this weird fetish in survival horror games to make the gameplay utter ass, in order to make each situation more intense. The enemies constantly get licks in where they shouldn't, Shots miss because the gunplay is horrid. The player feels powerless. Except this doesn't create an intense atmosphere. It creates resentment because the gameplay is broken. How about make the gameplay actually enjoyable, mechanically deep and complex, and then introduce challenging situations that test the player's mastery of the mechanics? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be entertaining? Anyway, Nightingale is dead, and the midnight darkness dissipates in an instant. No idea how. And suddenly Alan is back in reality. What? Why? How? To be fair, it is still early in the story. I'm sure everything will make sense by the end. And instead of getting the hell out of the woods filled with lunatics post haste, especially when there's a civilian with us, instead of wasting no time questioning this sudden star witness to all this nonsense, the game suggests we go explore the bushes a bit more. Who knows, there might be something worthwhile to find. Here's the local map, the story critical path of the woods I've marked with red, and the newly opened optional explorable part is marked with blue. You'll notice that this forest is in truth comprised of hallways. The game as a whole is extremely restrictive, the areas are tiny, and even though most of it takes place outside, every level is a series of tunnels walled up with bushes and cliffs. And every single optional spot is yet another short hallway, it's a crude illusion of the great outdoors. 
So what can the player find by taking any of these detours? Ammo, health, batteries, all the things they need to survive. Though notably, the contents of every cabin and locker are randomized between saves. And what this means is that by the time the player is done with exploring and fending off the enemies guarding the loot, they may end up worse off resource-wise than when they began. As happened to me, my ammo reserve was dry after checking out the optional routes around Cauldron Lake. The RNG decided to spam health packs at me. I do not need health, I need something that will stop the enemy from hurting me in the first place. Thank you very much. Now kindly fuck off. And the game actually has the goal to expect people to scour these places multiple times. There are several locked up spots and containers, which the player needs to backtrack to after they acquire tools to break the locks. Instead of doing the sensible thing, such as climbing over the fence, call it ludonarrative dissonance all you like, for me, it only underlines Saga's characterization as a moron. Exploration is useless gameplay-wise. There is no reason to check any of these optional spots. The game gives enough ammo and other supplies along the main route to kill everything in the game twice over anyway. The player basically gambles with their resources if they decide to explore. And it's not thrilling to walk around in the world intrinsically, since the level design is so bland and restrictive. It's padding. The game tries to create a mirage of meaningful choices and player involvement, yet the only correct choice is to just keep walking the main path so that the game is over faster. The only sort of incentive to stray from the path is to hunt for the handful of unique collectibles scattered throughout the game, charms and lunch boxes, which give Saga permanent buffs. The benefits of these are minor compared to the wasted ammo and time to acquire them. Example, just before the final stretch of the game, there is a charm guarded by a group of enemies, a bunch of ammo later, what is the reward? A charm that gives the possibility of stunning enemies with the flashlight. Sometimes. You know, the thing the flashlight is already supposed to do. And let's just take a massive step back and think for a second what is actually happening here. Suspension of disbelief is something that close to every story asks from the audience. We have to accept that something highly unlikely happens that sets events into motion. Or we have to accept that something fantastical exists in the universe. That's the basic requirement to enjoy storytelling, especially fantasy. However, every story has only a certain threshold for eccentricity, or just plain dumb moments, before the whole thing crumbles under the pressure of pure stupidity, and the audience immersion is atomized. This holds true with every aspect of art, presentation, world building, characterization, and in the case of video games, even gameplay, now the tolerance for absurdity is obviously different for everyone, but there are certain universal standards I'm sure we can all agree on. Namely, the threshold for absurdity is directly in correlation to what kind of story we are talking about. For example, if a game presents the world as a silly slapstick cartoon, then the player is going to take the story less seriously by default. The characters are over the top, the plot is hyperactive, dialogue is 99% jokes, the gameplay has no link to reality, it's supposed to be ridiculous, everything is fueled by rule of cool, gameplay is king, don't think about the logic all too much. Reasonable, right? Now conversely, if a game presents itself as more grounded and realistic, even gritty, then there's less leeway for tomfuckery, everyone looks like actual humans, kinda. The world is supposed to be our world, the only difference is the existence of specific supernatural forces. This one fantastic element does not open the door for the writers to do absolutely anything they like. Humans have to act like humans, events have to be consistent with real world society and logic, and it should go without saying, 
The supernatural also has to be internally consistent with established rules. And that's the key word in every story. Consistency. It is always best to lean towards either end of the spectrum, make a realistic tale with curated elements of fantasy, and take it seriously, or make an over-the-top fun ride, bright and energetic and full of joy, and own the fact that it's nonsense. Mixing these two runs the risk of breaking immersion and becoming a cringy half-hearted mess. It can be done successfully, but it takes careful effort and moderation. So how exactly are the buffs in Alan Wake 2 explained? Saga finds scattered dolls and crayon drawings in the woods, which need to be placed in certain positions, as dictated by a children's poem, so that it manifests key rings into reality, which Saga can wear on her wrist, in order to give herself more health, or more powerful flashlight. And if that sounded like the ravings of a madman, then all I have to say is... Yes. Yes, it did. This is the literal explanation the game provides. The children's poems alter reality and manifest magical keyrings. Let's do another one. Saga finds these lunchboxes, which are filled with scraps of Alan's manuscript, and after she collects enough of them, they combine into full pages of fanfiction and alter Saga's weapons. Like thus. Saga had lost count of how many shots she'd fired, but she was sure it must have been more than she had in her magazine. And yet, she'd not run out of ammo, as if the magazine had grown to fit more bullets. She fired again. Alan's reality-altering powers can make it so that Saga's magazines hold more bullets. So why can't he just write it so that the gun has infinite ammo? Here's another one. The report of the shotgun rang in the air. The enemy fell. Saga felt a surge of new energy. She'd been dead tired before, but was ready for more now. She would get through this. She continued on. Saga has the superpower to siphon life force from her enemies, but only if she kills them with a shotgun. What the fuck is this? This is ridiculous. Why has the game decided to contextualize its gameplay systems in this kind of manner? It's not just a gameplay mechanic, don't think about it. No, the game offers a canonical explanation for this. It is part of the story. And it's the single dumbest thing anyone has ever put on paper. This is the same as if the new Mario game suddenly tried to offer a literal explanation to 100 coins turning into an extra life. It would be idiotic. It's a nonsense game mechanic in a silly cartoon world. No one gets fixated on it because it isn't given plot emphasis. As an author, the more you try to rationalize nonsense magic, the more you invite scrutiny. If you can't explain it, then do not even try. No explanation at all is better than a shit explanation. This? This is lunacy. All the characters are lobotomized aliens. There's no humanity. Humans question things. Humans want to know things. In the universe of Alan Wake 2, no one reacts to anything, even with the most absurd shit happening all around them. <laughs> How do you suppose these lunchboxes ended up in the woods in the first place? Rose, the waitress from the cafe, is a fangirl of Alan, and Alan has been sending her psychic messages that she should go and stash away collectibles across the fucking woodlands, so that when the new protagonist arrives, she can find them and magically upgrade her weapons with the power of fanfic. How the hell do random pieces of scattered text combine into coherent script? There's no way to make sure which specific set of scribbling Saga finds, and why does the effect only activate once Saga collects enough of the text? The text already exists! 
the art already exists. All these buffs should be active from the start. Why doesn't Rose just give the fanfic to Saga the first chance she gets? Instead of hiding them across the woods, the game insists that Rose doesn't know who the new hero is. But that is impossible, since the fanfic itself is specifically addressing Saga. She is mentioned by name. Rose should know Saga is the one she is supposed to help. When you snort up those crayons and you hear that crunchy sound, that means you are supposed to stop. No one forced the devs to have an upgrade system. No one forced them to try and explain it. It is not my job to ignore obvious shite shoveled at me. Suspension of disbelief means that I as the audience give you reasonable freedom to tell your story the way you want. And in turn, you do not treat me like a brain dead idiot donkey. Piss off, Sami. And it's still not the dumbest this game gets. There are several ammo stashes left by the cultists. And how do you suppose they are locked? Simon Says minigame for five year olds. The cult are imbeciles. Each and every single one of them. They are too stupid to breathe without someone reminding them. They all ride the short bus. Ralph Wickham tells them all to stop being so flippin' retarded. How is it possible that the cult hasn't been found out by the sheriff by now? Someone stole the doorknob so that I can't get into the room with the hunting rifle. I have to go through ridiculous hoops, solve some stupid riddles and get the doorknob from another room. Instead of blasting the door into pieces with my shotgun, can't get inside without breaking the lock with a screwdriver. Better go find one. Or just crank open the window that is already ajar. Go through the window, Saga, you miserable idiotic bitch. The closer you get to reality, in terms of world building and graphical fidelity, the less room you have for this kind of shit. You designed these environments, every detail, the player can't avoid them, they are not extra content, this is the main path. You chose to have these scenarios, have them make sense. Do not break my immersion every chance you get. Not only is the exploration in this game a waste of time, it is also actively mangling the story even further. There is nothing of value in this game, the story is ass and the gameplay sucks the rancy juices. This is waterboarding in video game form. Back in Bright Falls, the agents tried to question Alan, hoping to get to the bottom of this supernatural conundrum. Alan is being less than useful, not because he doesn't want to help, but rather because he's feeling a tad out of sorts. Amnesia is a popular plot device used by hacks, fair enough. While Alan straightens up his thoughts, staring at a murky puddle, we stumble down memory lane, through time and space, back to the dark place. Alan's part of the story takes place in the past, when he was still trapped in the nightmare. Except it doesn't, because the two campaigns take place at the same time, side by side, as shown when the two worlds intersect at several points in the game, and the two protagonists have a glitchy interdimensional Skype call. So Alan is in the real world, and he is also in the dark place, at the same time. That's what the game is trying to tell us. I'm sure everything will make sense by the end. And yes, after two hours since starting the game, a game titled Alan Wake 2, we finally get to play as Alan Wake. And when I say play as Alan, I mean we get to watch cutscenes starring Alan. Lucky for me, I don't have to spend time explaining the story of Alan's campaign in great detail. I can just have the game do it for us. Enjoy. Yeah. 
Good to see you, Alan. Uh, uh, this must be an exciting time for you. Tell me, does it ever get old? Sorry, does what get old? Publishing a new book. Are you okay there, my friend? You look like you've been cooped up in the writer's room for a few too many years. <laughs> this is exactly how I feel. <laughs> you know, I've waited so long to get my hands on the sequel to Departure. You left us on quite the cliffhanger. We've all been dying to know what it's not a lake, it's an ocean really means. You and me both. Well, our wait is over. Your new book, Initiation, hits the shelves tomorrow. What? That's exactly what every reader will be asking. This book is mind-bending. It's so cerebral. I mean, how would you describe it? A an auto-fictional thought experiment? A, a, a horror story? A postmodern detective story? Wait. This isn't right. I, I haven't written anything. He's so humble. <laughs> okay. You got me. Good prank. Very funny. But yeah, I sad to say, I, I, I've not written this. I, I'd remember if I'd written a book, right? Or maybe it was written by your evil double. Well played, man. That is spot on. Playing the role here. Pretending the world of the book overlaps our own. That's very meta indeed. You see, Initiation tells the story of a fictional writer named Alan Wake, who is trapped in a nightmare, desperately trying to find the manuscript of a novel he has forgotten he has written. The book is set in New York, but it might not be New York at all. He is tormented by his dark doppelganger and guided by visions of a fictional detective he has written. That's right. Alex Casey is in this book as well. Uh, I guess we'll just keep doing this the whole show. The joke's on me. But isn't that what you sign up for with auto fiction? No, but seriously, I found the, the structure of the reality you build in the book fascinating. It reminded me of The Matrix. I mean, the writer is physically in his writer's room, trapped there, and he projects himself out to this dark dream of New York through the story he is writing. Uh, like astral projection. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Go on. I should be taking notes here. Uh, this is great stuff. Notes to that other Alan Wake in that room writing this as we speak? Are we all in your story, Alan? <laughs> wow. No, I, I, I wish you every success with your new book, Alan. I hope it's as successful as your best-selling Alex Casey series. Initiation hits the shelves tomorrow. After this, I'm sure we'll all be eagerly awaiting the culmination of this Hero's Journey trilogy of yours. A book called Return, perhaps. Yeah, thank you for one of the strangest interviews of my entire career, Alan. <laughs> All this talk of meta narratives. I have to expect them to disappear once this scene ends. And this is literally the plot. There is nothing more to gleam, no trickery, just straight up this. Alan runs around a fake city, retracing the steps of a fake detective who's working on a fake case accomplishing nothing in the end. None of this matters. There's no tangible reason to do any of this. Alan does everything in his campaign simply because he, or his dark doppelganger, <laughs> has written it that way. He has to follow the adventure line to the finish, hoping that this will somehow lead him to escaping the dark place, because that's what it says in the script. At least in Saga's campaign, as dumb as every story beat is, there is something actually going on. There is a direction, the story has an end goal, whether that be finding the truth behind the cult, fighting the creeping threat of the Taken, 
saving people from peril, stopping the dark presence from taking over the world. As for Alan, he's just fumbling in vain for five or so hours. The campaign ends at the exact place where it began. The status quo at the start is presented as Alan being stuck in the nightmare, in an endless struggle of him trying to write a story that would let him escape, only to be somehow foiled by the Dark Presence and Mr. Scratch before he can finish. An infinite game of cat and mouse, Alan and Scratch redrafting the story back and forth, and in the end, nothing has changed. Alan can't escape, the Dark Forces are simply too strong. The current draft of the horror story forms an endless loop where Alan writes himself, writing himself, writing himself, and all of this is me simply describing the premise as presented. Obviously, none of this makes any sense. There are no rules, people teleport around, places manifest and disappear at random, everything and anything just happens, again, just because that's what it says in the script. Both the one Alan wrote, and the one the game developers wrote. Very meta indeed! To break the story entirely, all one needs to ask is why the Dark Presence is even trying to stop Alan's escape. This is jumping ahead in the revelations, but it turns out that Mr. Scratch, the physical avatar of the Dark Place, is not Alan's doppelganger, but rather a different personality living inside him. Even though it was previously shown that the two were separate entities. Always great when a twist requires a retcon on the fly. Really makes me care about this clusterfuck narrative. That being the case, there is no reason for the Dark Presence to try hinder Alan's escape. The Dark Presence wants to infect the whole world with its nightmare. If Alan escapes, so does Scratch. And Scratch can take over Alan at any time. Once he gets out, it's game over. Or it should be, if any of this made any kind of sense. Bottom line, there are no stakes during Alan's campaign. His portion of the game doesn't have any reason to exist. It's all a waste of time, running in circles quite literally. And in retrospect, when all the truths are revealed, it all becomes somehow even more pointless, since the antagonist of the piece could have won at any time. All they had to do was let the hero think they won. And Alan himself is such a wet fart in this game. He has nothing to say or do, he has no energy, he just goes along with the plot as a generic protagonist man. I have to go here, I have to write, the dark place is bad, Scratch is a meanie. Blah, 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 blah. To project myself through the dark place. To look for a way out. The story that brought me here brought me nowhere. Loop me back. I was writing this story. And in the story, I now stepped into the writer's room. Not that he was complex in the first game, but at least there he had some fire in him. Dealing with the alien situation and trying to save his wife, it was all stressful. The anger and frustration, the way he lashed out at people around him, with low tolerance for bullshit, it was very human. He was presented as a person with flaws, but also a person with unflinching drive. There was Alan Wake the person, in addition to Alan Wake the plot device. In the second game, he comes off as bargain bin protagonist guy number 665. There's nothing to him. He's not hardened or jaded by his experiences. Everything is just new and weird to him. As if he hasn't been enduring the horrors for 13 years. There's no character development from the previous game. His biggest contribution to the narrative is expo dumping everything to Saga. That and being pretentious. In a horror story, there are only victims and monsters. And the trick is not to end up as either. But trapped by the genre, we are all ripped to pieces along the way. Okay, if there's only victims and monsters, then how are you supposed to not end up as either? Alan, you're a writer, you do know the meaning of words, this word specifically. This is the opening monologue of the game and it's pure bollocks. Trapped in the genre, stop drinking your own jizz. This is the end result. Is Leon S. Kennedy a victim, or is he a monster? Is Ripley at the end of Aliens a victim, 
or a monster. Parliament Tower, our home in New York. Was I really this close to being home? Going up to our apartment? Would I be home? Or was this just an echo of the real thing? You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. It's an illusion, you muppet. You are inside a nightmare realm. Of course it's not real. But this useless purple prose narration is just part of Alan's character. That's something the writer made sure to carry over from the first game. So our choices of heroes to root for are between insufferable and insufferable. Simply marvelous. On the gameplay side of things, Alan is the same as Saga, same clunky combat, same lackluster exploration. The big difference is that there's even less of it. Alan's levels are shorter, more linear, with less optional rooms. Yes, rooms, not areas. This fake noir city is ridiculously tiny. It's laid out in such a way that at first glance it looks bigger than it actually is. But every street is a dead end, there are no optional buildings to enter, nothing interesting to see. In truth, it's a single town square acting as a hub surrounded by separate levels. You get to explore a subway, a whopping two stories of a hotel and a cinema building. And what a waste this is conceptually. This is supposed to be a nightmare world where anything can happen and all the devs can think for level themes are these basic bitch real world locations. Why not set the game in the real world, in a real city, if this is all the creativity they can muster? There's no reason to look around and try to be immersed, because there's no sense of place and history. All of this is fake, this city does not exist. These are not real places, even in the context of the fictional universe. It's all just soulless. In any story, and especially a thriller horror adventure tale, the milieu is supposed to be a character in itself. Think how much games like Bioshock or Dead Space or the original Resident Evil gained from the setting. These classics would not be the same without the history and imposing presence of Rapture or Ishimura or the Spencer Estate. Bright Falls is a clear example that the devs understand this fact. There is attempts made to create a place that feels real and lived in. The problem is that everyone living there is a lobotomized cucumber and the town itself is a lazy horror cliché. Still, Saga gets to explore the real actual place while Alan bums around ineffectual in a sterile Call of Duty map. As for combat, whereas Saga has a whopping 5 enemy types, Alan gets only 3, which is actually more like 2. There's the basic mook, the speedy guys, And then these plain shadow phantoms, who just hang around and aggro only when the player gets close. They also die with just the flashlight, poof, gone, no guns needed. This barely qualifies as an enemy, it's a wibbly wobbly obstacle if anything. There's no reason to engage them, just run past all of them. Actually, that's most of Alan's campaign. It's perfectly feasible to run past all encounters. The phantoms are the most common enemy type, and even other enemies can be outrun with relative ease. It's pathetic. And if you have yet to realize the pattern, let's spell it out. The game is obviously favored towards Saga's campaign in terms of content. Further imbalances, Saga's weapons. She has a handgun, a shotgun, a crossbow, a rifle, another shotgun, two types of flares, flashbangs, and throwable gas canisters. As for Alan, he has a revolver, a shotgun, flares, a flare gun, and flashbangs. In case you need me to do the math for you, that's 9 against 5. As for collectibles, Saga has charms and lunchboxes, both of them meant to further her abilities. Meanwhile, Alan has only one collectible. These scribbles on the wall need to be beamed with the flashlight. Because... Uh, 
and they gift Alan with words, words of, of power, power, which is far less epic than it sounds. Basically, each collected word, word of, of power, power gives a choice between three of buffs. And just like with Saga, hunting these is borderline worthless. There is so little combat in this game that any ability which makes the encounters even more trivial is an overkill. I especially love the one that makes Alan harder for enemies to detect. Just skip the whole game, why don't you? Boss fights? Saga has five encounters. Alan has... Zero! And here's some more numbers for you. Of the 13 hours it takes to complete Alan Wake 2, on a run which includes a moderate amount of exploration, hunting for extra resources, poking around, smelling the roses, playing the game as intended, the amount of time spent actually playing the game, which means fighting enemies and doing puzzles, adds up to 4 hours. Round it up. Two thirds of the game is spent in some variety of story sequence, slow walking with NPCs, talking with NPCs, actual cutscenes, watching home videos, filling up the case board, profiling, or just moving from place to place, in an empty world where there are no enemies and nothing of substance happens. This video game barely qualifies as one, Four hours of gameplay drowned in twice the amount of fluff. This is inexcusable. At no point in any of the interviews or any of the trailers is the game presented as a never-ending sequence of unskippable cutscenes. It looks like a sequel to the first game with decent focus on gameplay and a story to contextualize the action. This is outright false marketing. If the amount of core content was presented honestly, up front, I would have never touched the game, and I know many others would have skipped it as well. I didn't sign up for some telltale non-game or another David Cage meme adventure. And it wouldn't be such an issue if the tiny amount of gameplay that is there was actually enjoyable, and if the story was even halfway decent. But as I've already shown, the gameplay is basic and boring and broken and can be skipped for the most part. And the story is a constant cringe fest of idiotic characters and self-indulgence from the writers. Look at this. Here's Alan's replacement mechanic to Saga's case board. Every so often, there are these echoes of the past. Alan sees the fictional detective Alex Casey talking about a criminal investigation that never happened because it's all fake and he somehow gets inspired by this, which allows him to rewrite reality in predetermined places. What this means in gameplay terms is that the level remixes slightly and a new path opens forth. There is no thinking needed, all of these are along the critical path, clearly marked, there is a lock and there is a key. Just put the key in the lock and open the door. That's what actually happens. It's all needlessly complicated, stylized crap. And you have to let these conversations play out every time to the finish, otherwise you won't get the key. Words fail to fully describe how lame and spirit rending and just fucking infuriating it is to stand there and listen to all this nonsense throughout the game. The plot board was empty again. I needed to... It's getting real, all right. I recognized my writer's room on the stage. I almost dreaded the ideas this would conjure up. Nice. nice set you got here. What was the scene in this room? Well, this is what we call the writer's room. In the play, it's where the devil rewrites reality whilst God is asleep. The devil was our star role. I got a big time celebrity to play him. And he was method acting the role to perfection. He never broke character, always wore the coat mask. 
His name was scratched out on the posters. Mm -hmm. And who was this mystery celebrity? Let me guess. Alan Wake? I wish I could tell you. But turns out there were masks upon masks. Whoever he really was? Shit got weird when he was around. Some of the crew joked that we'd actually hired the devil to play himself. Mm, Mr. Scratch is the devil. He was born to play the role. I had to agree with Casey on that. I honestly do not understand. Who the hell thought this was a good idea? Who thought this was entertaining? It would take special kind of cluelessness. Someone so full of themselves. So sure everything they write is pure captivating narrative gold. That even a snippet of some fake paranormal crime drama that has nothing to do with anything and never gets resolved is worthy of the audience's full attention. The plot changes shape the world around me. Oh really? I hadn't noticed. I've only been playing this stupid game for 10 hours at this point. I've seen this dozens of times. Stop stating the obvious. Shut the hell up, you bland dumbass. And because one unnecessary substitute for keys and locks is not enough, here's another one. Alan has this special portable lamp that can siphon light from different sources and unleash it elsewhere. Which, once again, alters reality somehow on the spot. It's another key, it's another locked door, put the key in the lock. It's not impressive, this is not challenging. The exact places where this trick can be activated are marked on the heart. There is no critical thinking required. All of this is retarded. Instead of wasting effort on all of these useless mechanics, the case board, the profiling, the redrafting, the light bearing. The devs could have polished the gunplay, fleshed out the level design, made more of the actual game. But no, this was the priority. Standing around, listening to rando characters yammer on and on and on and on and on and on about things that have nothing to do with the plot. And doing some brain dead puzzles. Modern AAA gaming, everyone. This is something that has consistently gotten worse with Remedy. Max Payne 1 and 2 were simple shooters, solid for their time, with a basic story about a detective avenging his family. Alan Wake starts to get wank, mediocre gameplay-wise for its time, and the story is overplayed and stupid. And here we also start with the excessive on-rails boring walkie-talkie crap. Then we have Quantum Break, a cover shooter from 2016 that feels like it was made in 2012. The story is complete dog shit, stale characters and time travel idiocy, and half the narrative is hidden outside the game in a literal TV show running parallel to the game. I didn't watch it, the servers were down, which I consider a blessing. And guess what? I understood the plot perfectly fine even without it. Tells all you need about that disaster. Control is no better. The story and characters are boring. Weird for the sake of weird. While also being extremely safe. And the gameplay is garbage. It's a pseudo metroidvania with the worst map in all of gaming. And the enemies are obnoxious bullet sponges. It's overly long with a dull gameplay loop. And an upgrade system based on randomized loot. Just do the Resident Evil 4 Dead Space thing and let me buy what I want. Unless it's a literal looter shooter. Random upgrades are dumb. The games have gotten worse, but at least they were games. With most of the runtime consisting of gameplay. And then we arrive to Alan Wake 2, a full-on walking simulator with scattered bits of gameplay. Just enough so that it can be marketed as action horror survival game. Remedy has gone sharply downhill since its inception. People shift in and out. The studio obviously isn't the same it was two decades ago. But Sami has been the creative behind all these projects. 
so I'm going to levy most of the blame on him. This is a man who desperately wants people to think of him as an author, an artiste. His stories are overly complicated, pretentious, postmodern sludge, because telling a simplistic story with all this added nonsense as a smokescreen makes one smart, right? His characters are caricatures, and his dialogue is either stilted and obvious, or stilted and meaningless. Casey! You're the killer, the cult leader. It's in your eyes. No! You've got the wrong man! It's Scratch! There's no time to lose! You're going nowhere! Dramatic! To shut up. Feel. I, I can't believe you don't shut up. Place. I was the dark place, the source of it all. The vessel. Me and the writer. We were the same. You are a fake person dreamed up by another fake person in a fake world, and I mean fake within the context of the fictional world. Nothing you say matters, shut the hell up. Sami is more interested in wanking his own presence as a author, rather than writing likable characters or creating satisfying narratives. There is an entire 15 minute short film in the game, which has nothing to do with anything, just him and his actor buddies doing a home movie horror flick. There's all this extra crap in the game, Yet everything having to do with the gameplay is as basic as you can imagine. There is no innovation, no reason for this to be a video game. It offers nothing of value to the player. Sami doesn't want to create games. He wants people to be at awe of his ideas. The same as every other literary school failure who works in the gaming industry, every one of these dipshits churning out these cinematic walkie-talkie narrative-driven experiences is the exact same. None of them could break into the movie or TV industry, or actual literature, and that's saying a lot considering the current state of entertainment as a whole, so they default to video games, because gamers have zero standards. They can't distinguish between functional story and a literal fossilized dog turd. Just a lot of story means it's deep and meaningful. Most of the stories in video games nowadays could be told in tenth of the time these fuckers take. It's pure indulgence, since they don't have to work with screen time restrictions or page limits. Combine this lack of curation for hackery with the fact that video games are the most lucrative type of entertainment there currently is, and it's no wonder that the industry has been overtaken by pure incompetence. And here's a crazy idea. Since the devs don't care about making video games, instead of an interactive horror TV show, how about at least putting some effort into making the horror part of the experience effective? Make this a nightmare worth walking through. Most of the game is engulfed in darkness. That's a basic starting point. But what else do you got? I already talked about jump scares and how lame they are. <coughs> Enemies are not threatening. They look goofy, if anything. I'm gonna catch ya! <coughs> and I feel nothing but pure loathing for the characters. I could not care less what happens to them. <coughs> Ooh, 
you got the spooky PNG twitching about all twitchy and spooky. This is true horror. Now wet your pants. Any attempts in environment design or shocking scenarios are trite schlock. Something an itchy preteen considers horror. Oh my god, burnt up corpses in a subway. So spooky. Even though none of these people are real, this is a fake nightmare place. Fiction within fiction, none of this matters. But listen to the music, the noises. Oh, it's so intense. So spooky. Wow, look at this. A well filled with blood. So hardcore. So spooky. Spooky! Why exactly is there a well filled with blood? Whose blood is it? Samara on the rag again? Running away at the speed of sloth Got chased by a fart cloud It's coming to get me! Have you ever seen someone jogging for their life? What the hell is this? Like, move my dude! Run you fool! Eventually the game decides that we've wasted enough brain cells with Alan for a while, it's Saga's turn, and we snap back to reality. From here on, the game opens up, and the rest of the two campaigns can be completed in any order the player chooses. Both of them have to be completed. The choice doesn't impact the story or the gameplay, it's a meaningless selection between suffering and saving a different brand of suffering for later. We've been given the right to choose between a douche and a two. Saga receives her next quest from Mr. Wake, not after questioning him, not because some new clue that leads into cunning deduction, but because Mr. Wake hands Saga the script, which literally tells her exactly where to go and what to do. But the game won't just let me get on my way. Wake has more information. I need to keep questioning him. But the game won't just let me talk to him more. I have to put everything I just learned on the stupid case board, hear the explanation all over again, and then Saga doesn't even question Wake any further. She just states that she'll go. So the game just fucking lied to me. Wake didn't have any more information, you piece of shit walking simulator. This game is abysmal, it's abhorrent, it's an abomination. Fuck you, Sami, go French kiss a gator. So this clicker is the main objective for the rest of the game. It was first introduced in the original Alan Wake, as a good luck charm Alan gave to his wife Alice, who suffers from nyctophobia. It later evolved into a magical Deus Ex Machina MacGuffin due to the reality alteration going on, and it has the ability to drive away the dark presence. You might notice that the original game was a tad silly. In fact, it was ridiculous full of unintentionally funny moments. <laughs> jumping the shark, turning around, and jumping it again. You fight an evil possessed bulldozer at one point. But, and this is important, the game was also consistent with its style and tone. It was openly stupid and just a big suck of reference fest to Stephen King novels and Twin Peaks and Hitchcock. It was so lame in that certain B-movie type of way that at least you could laugh along with it. And once in a blue moon, there were also some genuinely funny moments. Characters with chemistry, solid quips, all the good stuff. It was much closer to the OG Resident Evil 4 than something like The Last of Us. The game was a cheesy, campy, 
horror themed action romp and that's all it was from beginning to end. The story of Alan Wake 2 takes itself so seriously that something like the clicker just does not belong anymore. All the characters are flat and boring. Everything is sold as much more intense and dark. The game starts with grisly man ass and gory heart carving. The tone has changed. This is all about presentation, as I mentioned before. You can't suddenly follow this type of graphic content with magical bullshit MacGuffin straight out of children's stories. Alright gang, we got to get the infinity clicker before Mr. Scratch gets it and takes over the world. And the clicker has also been buffed between games. Its only function before was to eradicate the darkness. Thematically appropriate, it's a literal light switch. Now, it works as an all-purpose amplifier for whatever reality alteration the user wants. The game itself literally calls it an amp. The villain wants it for themselves, so that they can gain... ...and complete their own intentions of... DARKNESS! NO PARENTS! Even though the whole point of the clicker was to be an anti-evil tool, now it can be used by evil to create more evil. There should have been a de-emphasis on this kind of magical junk, not make it the centerpiece of the story, again. Same goes for the manuscript pages. In the first game, they were mostly a collectible, optional. They had a snippet of text, no specific directions, they worked as foreshadowing to things that would come to pass in a little while, there was no way to know when or how exactly, this managed to create a bit of intrigue, suspense, because they were handled with restraint. In the sequel, the pages have been placed front and center. They spell out exactly where the protagonist is supposed to go. It's the laziest plot device. The plot would not happen without them. I cannot overemphasize how shit this is. The characters are literally reading the script. There is no way to take any of this seriously, yet the game plays everything 100% straight. It reads like a deranged fanfic of a silly fairy tale, where everything is suddenly itchy and dark. If I cared enough, I would feel second-hand embarrassment for the devs. The page placed me in a trailer, somewhere in Watery. I should ask around. The Koskala brothers are kind of a household name around here. Speaking of, uh, if you're looking for some fun, stop by Watery. Just down the road from Bright Falls, there's our Coffee World Amusement Park. There's Sauna, Sauna ja Vista. <laughs> Apparently, the area of Bright Falls has a sizable population of Finnish Americans. This was never mentioned before in Alan Wake 1. It has been invented for this game. Sami himself has stated he wishes to bring forth more Finnish things in his art. To put Finland on the map. To emphasize the finishness of the product. And what exactly do we get? There's sauna. Some billboards written in Finnish. There's a Finnish association clubhouse. With some folk music for geriatrics. And traditional Karjalan piirakka. Because nothing tastes better than damp ice-cold pastry whipped by the elements. Why are these outside? Who put them here? And guess what? As a Finnish person myself, I feel absolutely nothing. Bet you are surprised. I mean, I'm being represented. I'm supposed to be crying tears of joy. I'm being seen! I'm being heard! My culture is on show for everyone to see! I'm being accepted! And yet, I could not give less of a shit. I don't identify with any of these clowns, just because they allegedly share some common ancestral DNA with me. All of this is meaningless. It's a collection of the most stereotypical attributes from Finnish culture, 
The equivalent of this would be if all of America was presented as Stetson wearing country singers with hot dogs in one hand and a stars and stripes flag in another. It's silly, embarrassing, not because those things don't exist, because they do, but for the deranged obsession towards them. Not sure what puko means, but it looks like the knife is missing. Puko literally means knife in Finnish, so a puko knife would be a knife knife. Have you ever heard anyone call katana a katana sword? No, no you haven't, because that would be idiotic. And the biggest piece of Finnish influence in Alan Wake 2 isn't even original to this project. The character of Ahti has been brought in from Remedy's previous game Control, He's this quirky janitor guy, possibly a magical eldritch creature in disguise, since he shows up here and there without rhyme or reason, and always seems to know more than he should about what's going on. Don't know, don't care. His sole story contribution is to tell the protagonist where to go, when they need to know, because the manuscript pages and profiling weren't enough apparently, his big gimmick is his extra thick, extra stiff Finnish accent, as well as his peculiar speech pattern. The idea is that he takes Finnish idioms and translates them literally into English, which sounds odd, to say the least. Do you know where I could find the Andersons? Oh, you can never know where. Only a seaman can know that. But even the seaman... Got know everything. Fair enough. Thanks anyway. Anything good on that jukebox? We try to do good, but only Prime comes out. <laughs> Music from my Swedish brothers, old gods of Asgard, my pals, the Birkele Vikings. Birkele. Were you in the band? Minäkö? No, no. Not so much sweet that it fills the whole stomach. But uh, we have shared a stage or two. He's basically a walking joke, and yet no one except those who speak Finnish can grasp the full joke. And the actor Martti Suasalo was given a BAFTA back in 2020 for his original performance in Control. Good on him. He's a classically trained actor, known for his ability to adapt close to any kind of role. Would be nice if he was known internationally for an actual character, rather than a silly one-note supporting NPC in a video game. But that's the way these things go sometimes. I'd like to point out that we live in a world where the Simpsons get rid of Apu, an iconic part of their storied franchise bending the knee to professional victim types because they can't handle the fact that a cartoon character has a funny voice. And at the same time, the depiction of a stereotypical funny speaking foreigner working man gets gifted a video game Oscar. But I guess he has the correct skin tone, so it's fine. And who could resist celebrating the most defining aspect of Finnish culture? Bring out your inner Wolverine with Armavir. Wow, this is the best party ever. Thanks, Armavir. Armavir is a traditional Finnish lager, and we drink it the Finnish way. At the bar, while actively avoiding small talk with strangers, Getting blackout drunk on a boat during midsummer and trying not to drown. In the sauna, using your beer can to hide your pippeli from wandering eyes. Partaking in the Finnish tradition of kalsarikennit, drinking at home alone in your underwear with no intentions of going out. Because an entire nation being chronically depressed and living a nameless life and drinking itself to death is funny. And it is, I'm just pointing out the rules here, that is the standard we are going with, no topic is taboo, freedom of expression and all that, 
it's open season far as I'm concerned. Keep that in mind going forth. Is this all Finland means to Sami? Sauna, Karjalan piirakka, Ralli Englanti. Up in the ass of Timo. A few scattered Finnish phrases here and there. <laughs> is this everything there is to being Finnish? I'd say we Finns are capable of so much more than that, like making several hour YouTube videos criticizing garbage art in excruciating detail. Very meta indeed. And just so we are clear, I'm not offended. There is nothing to be offended by. It's a bunch of stuff. Look at all the stuff coming from our country. This is funny to me, if anything. The combination of half-assed execution and in-your-face bravado just permeates absolutely everything in the game. The one piece of consistency this piece of shit can muster. No one outside of Finland cares about Finland. And that's fine. There's no reason to put any of this here or try to integrate it to the lore. Interestingly, the game was originally going to have even more Nordic representation. Here you see footage from the original Alan Wake 2 teaser trailer seven years ago. Lots of meaningless artsy wank. But the characters are all there. Alan, Casey and Saga. Though you probably noticed something is a bit different about Saga. I'm just gonna let you ponder it for a while. Don't want to spoon feed it to you. Introducing Sweet Baby Inc., a narrative development and consultation company with the goal of helping studios make their games more engaging, more fun, more meaningful, and more inclusive. Here's a selection of their projects. A bunch of things suddenly start to make a hell of a lot more sense. Now officially, the company worked on character arc, voice, and sensitivity reading, figures, all the characters are two-dimensional at best, and their arcs are non-existent, the voice of every single character is the same, that being an insufferable twat with all the charisma of a moldy watermelon. And as for sensitivity reading, that's basically Corpo speak for the simple agenda of Put a chicken in, make a lemon jerk! This is a company that specifically makes any product they touch worse, infecting it with the modern day brain rot, the progressive intersectional feminist obnoxious soapbox virtue signaling comes first, and the story comes a distant second. All the cornerstones are here. Every white hetero male is pushed aside, literally gifting their spot in the story for the stunning and brave black woman who can do no wrong. The game called Alan Wake 2 is not about Alan Wake. He is a loser, achieves nothing in his own story, he is a plot device in his own game. He literally writes Saga to be the new hero in universe because he himself sucks so much. He's weak and pathetic and just cannot do anything without the help of this new stunning and amazing character. A character who just so happens to fill the quota for the almighty diversity. Let's all pray at the altar of diversity. Praise diversity. Only diversity can cleanse the world of evil. Man bad, white worse, woman amazing, black even better. This is the doctrine. And the narrative can never deviate from it. Everyone who is not the stunning main hero is an incompetent doofus. And even though the stunning hero herself is in fact an incompetent doofus also, she is always presented as the most magnificent person ever to walk the earth. No struggle, no journey, no growth, nothing of value. This kind of storytelling is fundamentally hollow. After years upon years of this stuff, 
it has become tiresome and predictable. But of course, none of this is done for the sake of immersive art or to tell a story. Oh no, 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 no. It's all for the sake of catching the money, the ESG score. In case you do not know, there is a whole system in place where companies get rated on the level of pandering and propaganda they produce. Um. Wealthy investors literally gift companies money depending on how much they serve the entire lefty totalitarian white heteros are evil replace them all revisionist history globalist support the current thing agenda. It's intended to break your spirit, to whip you down, to kick you in the dirt so that you know your place. It's done to manipulate you, the common folk, into thinking the way the people at the top want you to think. This is not a theory, it's not a secret. The people involved are fully vocal about it. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock we are forcing behaviors. 54% uh, of the incoming class are women. We, we added four more points in terms of diverse uh, employment this year. And it, if it, it, you know, what we are doing internally is if you don't achieve these levels of impact, it, your compensation could be impacted, okay? We're it, doing the same thing. And so it's just, it, you have to force behaviors. And if you don't force behaviors, whether it's gender or race, or just any way you want to say the composition of your team, you're going to be impacted. I think one of the philosophies we've kind of had either either by mistake or I'll sound like, I'll say I did it on purpose to sound smarter, give people the stuff you know they want so you can inject things yeah. that maybe they aren't familiar with or maybe they don't know they want, but make them like that stuff. This is what entertainment has devolved into. We are at the point where the art you consume is openly made as propaganda for entertainment companies. Money is all that matters at the end of the day, and there's money to be made, so why not serve the wants of the ultra wealthy and powerful? And so, game companies hire other companies to actively mangle their products. They need extra help, because they are so incompetent they can't even manage fucking up all on their own. The world is one big farce. And do not fall to the trap of ignoring stuff like this as a small thing. When you let this one thing slide, then you will let the next thing slide, and then the next thing, and the next thing, and eventually you will become a drone who won't question anything. And then it's game over. Always think for yourself and question why things are the way that they are. Only the thinking person is truly free. It doesn't matter who made the final call, Remedy as the developer or Epic as the publisher, in my book they are both scum. And fuck your credentials as a writer, Sami, you gutless, talentless charlatan. You can't manage your own story by yourself. You have to bring in some random cunts from across the Atlantic to touch up your work. Have some dignity. Who the hell would ever let some no-name idiot come anywhere near their passion project that has been in the cooker allegedly ever since the first game? If this was demanded by the publisher, then tell them to fuck off and wash your hands of the project that's called integrity, and in the case this was your own decision, then it makes you as pathetic as your male leads. Fiction mimicking reality. You had the idea for Saga for years. You envisioned her as a classic Scandinavian woman, that's how you first established her to the world, and there has never ever in the history of storytelling been an instance where a creative dreams up a character and is so satisfied with their outward appearance that they feel comfortable unveiling them to the public, only to then suddenly think, hmm, this character isn't nagging enough, she needs to be more naggy, let's make her into a nagger, that's what's missing. 
And yet, Saga is suddenly race swapped. Why? What narrative purpose is there, other than pandering? There is none. The race does not offer anything to the story. The race does not matter. You know this. I know this. Everyone knows this. And everyone who claims otherwise is a filthy liar. You were willing to sell out your creative vision to score political points. You get to advertise the game with a strong independent black female lead, which automatically shields the story from criticism. Pointing out flaws is racism. No matter if Saga is soulless, psychotic, narcissistic, idiotic alien person, the gaming media and the brain-dead consumers will slurp it up and ask for seconds. Because they have no standards, except the surface level. She's enthusiastic about her job, she really enjoys what she does, but I think her most defining quality for me is her kindness. She's a very empathetic person, and she brings that into her work, and it makes her a better detective and profiler. Why the fuck you lying? Why, Why you always lying? I'm excited for the world to see Saga, because I think she's a brilliant role model. And just to see a woman in this role, a woman of color being a protagonist in a game that we don't see that often. Stop fucking lying! All of us have been working with Melanie, and because of the writing process being ongoing, there are always new ideas and writing it more and more specifically to her as a role. Another white asset deciding what I get to do, how I get to do it. And anytime someone like me comes along and points out the obvious, there are some fuckwits who start screaming, Well, if race doesn't matter, why are you talking about it, bigot? Because this is not about race, but about intent. The argument has never been and never will be, this story is bad because this character is the wrong race. No one actually thinks that. The point is the question why. Why is this character who used to be one race suddenly swapped for another? No one else has been changed. The white male characters get to remain as they are. No reason to diversify them. Since they get to do nothing anyway, the active part of the story has been gifted to the new diverse lead. We wanted to make absolutely sure that we find the right actor for the role, and we were looking for quite a while for Saga. And the voice actors of Saga is dreadful. Doing some meaningless TV dramas for wine ons does not make one a competent voice actor. Acting and voice acting are two different skills. Saga has a single intonation throughout the entire game. Are you thinking of retiring? You know what happens to cops who say this is their last case. Nice to meet you, Sheriff. I'm set for coffee. You know, I wouldn't say no to another. I'm Agent Saga Anderson. This is Agent Alex Casey. Um, I'm sorry. Who are you? I don't know what you're talking about. They act like they've known me for years. This keeps happening. Wait, this is my case. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. So there is no argument to be made that they simply chose the best actress possible. Alan Wake 2 would still be a worthless creation even if Saga was white as originally intended. The script would still be shit all the same and I would offer all the same arguments against it. This is just yet another example of developers making decisions not in pursuit of the best product possible, but rather for ideological reasons, and in order to maximize their marketing. It's insulting to storytelling, it's insulting to the audience, and it's insulting to the groups they claim to be representing. And remember, the moment there is more money to be made, every single one of these pandering con artists will throw their audience under the bus. Or off the roof. Money is everything. Just as being Finnish is a gimmick to Sami, so is being black. This is tokenization. That's the kind of product we have. That's the kind of world we live in. Everything is a commodity, even your identity.
At this point there is no reason to respect this story with any further examination. At least not seriously. It's broken. It's crap. Every decision is not made in service of functional story, but rather a combination of pandering and pretentious wanking. But let's follow along the adventure line to the finish anyway, for completion's sake, to see how silly it gets. Saga starts her hunt for the magical MacGuffin, can't walk down the nature trail without first chatting with the locals and profiling them. And if Saga had two brain cells to rub together, the whole conspiracy involving the cult would unfold right here. Ask the ghosts. Hmm, I wonder if these two eccentric gentlemen have anything to do with the cult? And boom, the flashbacks would reveal them to be indeed the leaders of the cult. Not that it matters much, because these idiots allow an FBI agent to walk around by her lonesome right past their hideout, where they have left all their plans conveniently out in the open for anyone to see should they come snooping. They have no reason to assume Saga isn't suspicious of them, they should have her under tight watch, have one of them escort her, make sure she doesn't poke around where she isn't supposed to, but the plot needs to happen as written, so intelligence is outlawed. Saga arrives at the place appointed by the quest marker, and just so happens to run into Thor and Odin, a pair of local celebrities, old school rock legends, Something of fan favorite characters from the previous game. It's so good to finally see you, Saga. I am your great uncle Odin, and this is your long lost Mortified Tar. Sarasoka. He is your grandfather. I am the old <laughs> Just as crazy as everyone else. And it turns out that this new Marisu fanfic addition to the cast is related to them. Oh wow, really? It's almost like this character was supposed to look totally different and was changed midway through production, and yet the story remained the exact same. And it's not some throwaway thing either, the rest of the game focuses heavily on this family dynamic, and I could not give less of a shit. Saga has never seen these people, the last time they saw her was as a baby, Saga's mother left home young and never came back, and kept Saga in the dark about her family, and Saga's father is also mysteriously missing. It's not interesting, it's telenovela tier drama. I don't care about these characters and their history. I despise Saga, and I don't exactly feel anything for Thor and Odin either. All of this is just suddenly dropped in here, and the writers expect the player to be invested. That's a huge ask, especially since they can't be arsed to come up with an organic way to reveal this. The dudes are just standing there, waiting for Saga, in meta sense, so that they can kick off the lost family drama storyline. Every interaction and plot point is so artificial it's revolting. Wait, how do they even know Saga is who she is if they haven't seen her since she was a baby? Turns out that Saga has inherited her psychic skills from this family line, it was never a thing in the previous game, Thor and Odin were simply old eccentrics from a bygone era, LARPing as guards for their rock act, and now they are some super special seer people spanning back generations? Yet another retcon. Would have been nice if they used their superpowers to do anything to help, back when things were going to shit the first time. Oh well. And all of this is 100% done to further shift the focus towards Saga as the main protagonist in the Alan Wake universe. The sequel slash DLC mystery bait is all about Saga's father, who is without a doubt Mr. Dor, the late night host from Alan's campaign. 
It's telegraphed so heavily it's practically confirmed. You knew him? Some doors are better left closed. And yes, there's this mini subplot all about Mr. Door. Alan runs into Sheriff Tim Breaker, who is also stuck inside the dark place. Remember, from the beginning of the game? Apparently, the chocolate Jay Leno has the ability to teleport people into the dark place at whim, for whatever reason. His motives are never given any reasonable explanation, something about not wanting Saga to be involved in this mess. But then again, he does absolutely nothing to actually prevent Saga being involved. It's all just nonsense. Reaching through to get what you want and that puts you in my path. I don't know what you're talking about. I have to go now. Maybe you will make it through this time. This has gone on long enough. This and our night springs was a nice distraction. It's time someone gave me a straight answer here. The next time we meet, the circumstances will be very different. And you would do well to return the favor by playing your part. Or stay out of my way, Mr. Wake. How exactly have I gotten in your way? Care to elaborate? Just talk to me. Tell me what not to do. I don't exactly have any kind of beef with you, so if there's something you want, maybe I can help? Stop talking in riddles and let's work together. Who's this mystery man? Oh, it wouldn't be much of a mystery if I knew. All I have is a name. Warlandor. The talk show host? No. No, that doesn't sound like him. The guy has many disguises, but a talk show host? No. I'll keep looking. Motherfucker! There are posters of him plastered all over the city. His name is literally Mr. Door. How many people called Door do you think there are? And do you understand the concept of a disguise? If something sounds like the person, it's a bad disguise by default. Everyone in this idiotic game is a useless wanker. So yeah, that goes nowhere extra fast. Gotta wait for the sequel. It's gonna be great. But focusing back on the main quest for the magical relic of magical magicness. Saga is supposed to find the clicker inside a trailer where she herself allegedly used to live once. It's Alan's story affecting reality. The whole thing about Saga's kid drowning and her being in denial. None of this is real. It's a red herring for the audience and for Saga. We are supposed to question whether or not the tragedy is in truth real. Except you'd have to be an utter moron to fall for this. It's already been revealed that Alan's story is fucking with reality. And Saga is, as we already know, a strong independent, stunning, black woman, so there is no possible way that the writers could ever make her a neglectful parent. That is not possible, that is not allowed, implying that black people could even theoretically be less than perfect is a racism. The writers wouldn't want to commit a racism now, would they? Very meta indeed. In any case, even though Saga has been adamant thus far, denouncing every instance of the fiction impacting reality as people being crazy, since she is also the dumbest person to ever exist, she loses her marbles when she sees a fake newspaper article about the fake drowning. No. It's not true. It's just a fucking story. It's not true. Logan's back home. She's fine. Fuck. She's at school. David. 
him in the story and it's coming true. Weeks said Scratch would try and hurt me with the horror story. Yes, it's all fake. You know this, you dumb idiot. Stop panicking. Nothing has changed. Get the clicker, defeat the evil mean darkness, and everything will go back to normal. The only reason this debacle with Saga's kid exists is to give her some vague sense of personal stakes. At least with Alan back in the day, Alice was actually there. She was present, she was a character, and she was physically taken away. Basic damsel in distress narrative. Focus on basic. Saga's version is a lame downgrade. Logan is not a person. She is a concept. A child of the protagonist. We do not spend any time with her. She doesn't even appear once on screen. Video games especially have this unique opportunity compared to all other types of media. The player gets to personally interact with the cast and slowly grow attached to them so that they can be invested in the events alongside the main character, feel what they feel. Obviously, this would require that the writing and dialogue are actually up to snuff. Casey, there are cultists in the area. They're taken, like Nightingale. Watch yourself out there. Yeah, thanks for the heads up. I'm still finding my way back. You have the worst sense of direction. <laughs> Any city in America I can get through drunk and blindfolded. It's these damn trees. Okay, okay. So we are fucked either way, but still, Alan Wake 2 completely squanders this storytelling tool. The game and the story do not offer any reason to care. The player does not share any moments with Logan, so there's no attachment. Even when the conversation is specifically about Logan, Saga merely uses her as a prop to talk about herself instead. Saga could just as well be worrying over a sack of rotten onions. And why is she freaking out in the first place? I thought all of this was supposed to be exciting! And before moving any further from the topic, the villain of this piece is incomprehensibly idiotic. Why would Scratch edit the story to involve Saga's child? That's only going to motivate her more. The only way she'll get her kid back is to beat the evil forces holding her hostage in limbo. What does Scratch think is going to happen? She'll give up? No, she's gonna come and shove the clicker down your throat, dumbass. Now in addition to the newspaper, Saga finds something else quite alarming. Or rather the plot shoves it in her face. A photo of Thor and Odin, posing with a cult member, posing with the clicker. Who the fuck took this photo? Why did they take this photo? What possible reason could there be for anyone involved to do any of this? The Gramps are not part of the cult, but they know about the cult. And they do not warn Saga or anyone else about the cult. What is this? And because one plot device is not enough, yet again, Tweedle Dum and Tweedle Twat appear to escort Saga to the cult's lair. Yes, the officers from the beginning of the game are part of the cult, and now they have also turned into darkness zombies. So... Scratch one, right? The clicker is in the possession of the forces of darkness. All they have to do is bring the clicker to Alan, who is in fact Scratch, remember? And the bad guys insta win. It's over. Nope, the double team Cherkovs decide to troll Saga and the player. Let's chase them to the hideout. LOL, jump scare, you stupid idiot, teleport away, come to the world between worlds for a boss fight. Why? What's the point? Why does nothing make sense in this game? Why is there not a single intelligent being inhabiting this world? The boss fight sucks, just like Nightingale. Two bullet sponges, this time with guns, taking cheap shots from up top, infinitely respawning, gotta purge these fart clouds, 
which somehow prevents them from respawning. Whatever you say, game. Clicker, back to home base. I need to get back to Bright Falls, to Casey and Wake. I should check in with Casey. Come on, Casey. No answer. David. Pick up, pick up, pick up. Hey, this is David. Leave a message. David, can you call me back, please? It's urgent. Please. Why isn't David answering? Is Logan all right? How does this all work? Has the horror story already gotten her? Wake should know. A few moments later. The flooding's lowered. I should look around. See where the water was hiding. Saga. We are in a bit of a hurry. Casey won't answer. Something is clearly going on. And Logan? Remember? Your daughter? No, we are not going to explore, you asinine shit nugget. I think her most defining quality for me is her kindness. She's a very empathetic person. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> Meanwhile, back with Team Useless, the cult is mounting a surprise attack on the lodge. Oh shit! Going for the direct approach? I approve. An all-out gunfight to end it all. Waste all these retarded pumpkins. And then Saga can come back with the clicker, and Scratch makes his move, and we get the final confrontation. This has to be the climax. There is no way the game is going to waste my time for six more hours after this fuck you game. Hey, what are you doing? So here, in a twist of game design, we get to play as Alan within Saga's campaign for all of two minutes. No, I am not kidding, I'll show you. I had escaped the dark place, so had the dark presence. Scratch, it was here, in Bright Falls. I could feel him as a growing pressure in my head. Stronger by the minute. Why didn't he kill me with the rest? What did he want? I needed to find Casey. We were on the same side in this fight. 
strength in numbers. We got a flashlight. Not nostalgic. That's Casey. He was still alive. be taken? Where did the dark presence not discriminate? Two minutes, two enemies, one chunky guy who you can't kill because there isn't enough ammo, and then another basic mook. What is the point of this? The game is openly mocking the player. Hee <laughs> hee, thought you get to play as Alan. Well, you thought wrong, you stupid fool. Here's your lame diversity hire back. Have fun, pisshead. Go hump a blender, Sami. I'm so done with you. FBI, drop the knife! Elmo? Sunny, don't understand! So how does this work exactly? The other cult members have been turned into Taken, yet Yako is just himself. Would have sucked if he had a darkness shield around him at this point. And Saga has been blasting everyone indiscriminately so far. Why is she suddenly disarming people? Go for the head. Plot armor. It plays no favorites at this point. Things just happen because script. So here, out of nowhere, the FBC arrive at the scene. For those who don't know, the Federal Bureau of Control is this fictional government agency introduced in Remedy's previous game, Control, which takes place in the same universe as Alan Wake. Because everything has to be a unified franchise universe nowadays, I guess. The FBC specialize in the study and containment of paranormal entities, and they have been monitoring Cauldron Lake for years at this point. The children's poem crayon puzzles I mentioned before are actually remains of the FBC's research. And no, this explanation does not make them any better, it makes them worse. Because this means that a government agency wastes their time playing with crayons, trying to open up gates of hell with children's poems, and then just leaves their material lying around, unattended, for anyone to mess around with. And since these clowns already have a presence in Bright Falls, why is their strike force only arriving now? They should have been at the scene even before the whole fiasco with Nightingale. It's revealed they've also been investigating the cult. They know what's going on. People are afraid, there's chaos in the air, 
forks are going missing and the FBC just sit in the sidelines, scratching their vaginas, instead of actually stepping in and putting a stop to all this. And after they finally decide to show up, guess what happens? Take a wild guess. They fuck everything up. All they need to fight the Dark Presence are flashlights and guns. They have those in spades. And yet they somehow still manage to lose off screen. Next time we see them, every single agent has been wiped out barring the one character with an actual name. Bullshit. The FBC have these huge heavy duty spotlights. Just point them at the enemies. They are holed inside the police station. Just keep the lights on. Arm everyone with a flashlight. There is no way these trained people working for the US government with automatic weapons can possibly lose against half a dozen zombies with access that are allergic to light. No, wait, my mistake. There are no automatic weapons anywhere. Seriously, in a story taking place in backwater America involving elite government agents, there is not a single automatic weapon in the entire game. I would even take bump stocks. Just give me something. Fuck anything else in the story. This is the one thing that absolutely should demolish everyone's immersion. If anyone was invested in the FBC after playing Control, personally I wasn't, but if you were, they've all been character assassinated. This includes the protagonist of Control, who is the current director of the FBC. Every single one of these supposed specialists are made into fools. Of course they can't be competent in their one and only job, because then we wouldn't need Saga to save the day. Wait! My partner, Agent Casey's MIA. We'll look for He's him. my partner, dammit! Agent? I be Go home. Oh my, I wonder what happened to Casey. I hope he's okay. Yeah, fake drama is fake. The FBC scoop him up off screen from the woods. The game just needed him out of the way for the next chapter so that Saga can go about things alone. Why couldn't we play as Casey? That would have been far more interesting, a proper survival tale in the wilds. In fact, we should have played the entire game as anyone else but Saga. Someone from the FBC? Esteves is right there. Or we could have played as Jesse. That would have made much more sense. And been more compelling. Have her be an active leader of the FBC. It would have tied the Alan Wake control universe closer together. Give us a stupid cheesy Iron Man war machine moment where her and Alan fight side by side. The whole plot is one giant piss take anyway, so you might as well give us something fun and fan servicey. And I don't even like Jessie. She's a bland Mary Sue with everything handed to her by convenience. But I would still take her over Saga any day. Jessie is lame, but Saga is pure human garbage with no reason to exist in the plot other than the one Alan forced her in. Or if you actually want to establish continuity and utilize the cast to its full potential, if you absolutely need a female co-protagonist working on a case in the real world, it should have been Sarah Breaker, the Lady Sheriff from Alan Wake 1. She knows about the Dark Presence, she's a veteran in weirdness, it would have been interesting to have her take charge, continue the story, give her more room to breathe as a character, and she's already tied to Bright Falls, so anything you wish to do secret family-wise could have worked so much better. And Sarah is far from the only one from the original cast who gets done dirty. Thomas Zane, the previous victim of the Dark Presence, who was an ascended sagely presence in the original story, helping Alan along his journey, is now some pathetic bohemian bum. No reason for the change. The writers just want it to be this way now. 
because creep factor and the red lights are super intense and cinematic, and this is a super serious and adult story. Look at how grimy and tortured he is. This is a story for mature people who enjoy dark drama. Everyone is insane and deep and tragic, and we are so smart and deep and psychological for coming up with this. And none of these scenes matter. Everything in Alan's story is useless filler, cut Zane out, and nothing changes. Barry is swept aside completely, the most entertaining character. He obviously can't be involved in the plot, since his existence consisted of jokes and one-liners. Can't have too much fun in this super serious gritty horror story. There's so much changed, ignored, or retconned from the first game that there is no reason to call this Alan Wake 2. Knowing the previous story only hurts the second one, the continuity is shoddy, world building is an absolute mess, tone is all over the place, and the old cast have been shafted. This is essentially a new story with the same basic premise, a reboot. The creators want to do these things now, and so they will force them, push the square peg into the star-shaped brown hole. Hey Anderson, like what I've done with the place? Hmm, could use a bit more glide. <sighs> Funny. Hello? That's not funny! Tor and Odin were in the photo with a the clicker. They might know how it works. I'm off the case, but I can still visit family. Hello? Saga! It's Tor, your grandfather. About time you were coming to visit, kiddo. How did you know I was coming to see you? Never mind that. We have bigger problems. We're losing. Oh, fuck! Fuck you, you fucking hag! Fuck! Shit. Something is off at that nursing home. Oh really? What tipped you off? Was it the screaming? Was it the sounds of struggle? Was it the phone call that was suddenly cut off? God, you're such a dumbass. People unironically call this story a masterpiece. So off we go, to the nursing home, where something seems off. And this chapter is 100% filler. It could be erased from the game, and nothing is lost. It's all about Saga getting in contact with her estranged family, and learning the true nature of her superpowers. That's boring. You're boring everybody! Quit boring everyone! And who do we meet guarding the gate? Why it's Rose, everyone's favorite freak. She's a waitress by day, and a nurse by night. Even though being a nurse is a full-time job, and there don't seem to be any other nurses, nor are there any doctors, even though the nursing home has a whole separate fully equipped medical wing, the people cobbling this clusterfuck narrative together have never spent a single day in the real world. And this is one of the most infuriating parts in the whole game, Rose is being all secretive, trying to keep Saga out, and Saga, for some reason, is indulging this, as if she isn't an FBI agent, as if she didn't just hear a man, her grandfather, calling for help, mentioning a crazy hag, who most likely, as far as she knows, is Rose, you stupid fucking bitch. Kick in the door and put a gun to her head and make her tell you everything. You do not have time for this horse shit. Casey is missing. Logan is in danger. There are supernatural entities running amok everywhere. Some secret government X-File LARPers just appeared out of nowhere and took Alan into custody. The only person who can fix this mess. You do not have time to waste. But no! We have to talk to the residents, we have to use the case board, we have to profile people, so that the ghosts of the past reveal what we already know. Rose is lying, she knows more than she's telling, 
Any fucking imbecile would know this from moment one. And act on it. Let me get on with the game. Stop wasting my time. Fuck you, Sami. You utter cunt nugget wannabe author shit with. No sane person cares about this. No one cares about Saga. No one cares about your cast of insane fake alien people. No one cares about this plot. Everything you write is garbage. If this was a book, if you tried to offer this shite to an actual literary publisher, it would be ridiculed as the most retarded thing to ever smear a pure page of paper. Every word you and your gaggle of fools produce is you raping the concept of storytelling. Fuck! Eventually, Saga does the obvious and demands Rose to tell what she knows. She asks and Rose tells. Exactly as would happen if anything in this game followed any kind of logic. Just streamline this whole section and let us get on our way straight away. So another resident of the nursing home is tormenting Thor. This ghost granny, she takes Thor hostage. So we have to go to the world between worlds once again, hunt down the bitch and have ourselves yet another lame boss fight. And here I have to comment on the level design again. As a whole, the game is as linear and unimaginative as can be, even when we are inside a messed up nightmare realm. There is nothing truly weird or dreamlike, just dilapidated real world locations. For the exception of a single gimmick, which the game spams constantly, there are these sections where the level loops around, and that is supposed to be oh so spooky and weird and oh no, I'm losing my mind. It's just lame, not interesting, it only further wastes the player's time, there is no challenge to deal with, no puzzle to solve, just keep walking and eventually the section will end. Or do the revolutionary maneuver of turning around and then the rest of the level has been secretly loaded in behind you. Wow, so amazing! Have you actually never heard of this little game called Super Mario Bros? Yes, in the original Mario, there is a section where the level loops until the player takes the correct path across the platforms and several games have copied this since in various forms. It's been a thing for almost 40 years. And here it's the most intricate and special the level design gets. As a game, this game is a sad, infantile offering. Like the boss itself, it starts with this super spooky section where you have to dash between these platforms, not staying in the water for too long, so that the boss doesn't insta-kill you. No idea why the granny won't insta-kill Saga once the proper fight begins. But it's just one of those video game things, I guess. So yeah, the game has some rough spots. I commented a couple of hours ago how the flashlight animation works only when it feels like it. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Anything moving on the screen, touch the controller, and you risk the game having an instant aneurysm. Textures fuck up, weather effects are disgusting, they're slow down, cameras passing out in tight spots, any kind of wonky shit you can think of, the game's got it. There's also several instances where dialogue loads at incorrect times, like here, where Saga wants to use the case board, 
to get to the bottom of the mystery of the wolves while they try to maul her face off. I have to work this out on the case board. And then there's the massive stuff, like here, when dying in this section made the game freeze. Black screen, nothing happens. I was frozen today! Have to load previous save. Same as with my trip through the Shadow Realm. And these are not rare. I had the exact thing happen to me multiple times. And just to make it crystal clear, this is not me trying to break the game. I'm not doing anything out of the ordinary. Even when played perfectly normal, following the adventure line and acting out the script like the game wants, it still falls apart. Now this one I didn't get myself, but there's also a major bug when trying to switch campaigns. Instead of switching between the two stories, the game loads up the opposite character into the other one's world. Here we have Alan running around in Saga's campaign. I mean, I'm just gonna go with it. Fuck it. That's the most fun I can have with this game. At least in the Saga uh, sequences. My grandma could climb over that. My grandma died this year. Oh, Saga? Uh, behind me? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's just not doing the audio. It's just standing there. Insert dialogue here. This game beat Mauler and ass. I mean, it's trying really hard to beat itself right now because it just deleted Saga from its game <laughs> files or something. <laughs> Just look at me going around here, it's like with my fucking gun in my hand. <clears throat> wasn't the right direction. <laughs> okay, Alan, you're not even supposed to be here, right? You you better shut the fuck up. It's impossible to progress at this point, since Alan can't use the case board. And trying to switch back also does nothing. The game is hard locked. The only way to fix this is to once again load a previous save. And none of these issues have been fixed by the time of me writing this. The game has been out for three months, and it's still a broken mess. How much was the budget again? Tämän toisen osan budjetin on arvioitu olevan, ainakin itse on nähnyt, semmoista 30-60 miljoonaa euroa budjettihaitaria. Mutta kymmeniä miljoonia euroja joka tapauksessa, mikä tekee siitä varmaan niin yhden äh, isoimmista suomalaisista viihdeteollisuuden tuotteista. 60 dollar game, minimal amount of gameplay, tiny linear levels. There is no excuse for this amount of technical problems. I remember the time, several decades ago, when games were released when they were done. You couldn't patch games, because consoles were actually consoles, and not underpowered PCs with constant connection to the internet, so any mistake would remain there forever. This incentivized developers to make a polished product, and release it only after the wrinkles were ironed out. What a time it was. Nowadays almost every game is developed with the mindset of release now, fix later, if ever. No integrity, no pride, just greed. Paying customers are basically beta testers. So what if early players have abysmal experience? We've got to have money. And while we are on the subject, fuck digital gaming, especially within the AAA industry. Games like Alan Wake 2 have no replay value, the average player will go through it in a weekend, 
and trade it back at their local game shop for something new. Or they would, if they could purchase the game physically. Do not be fooled. This is the only reason companies go fully digital. They don't want people to buy used to make smart financial decisions. They know that vast portions of the player base would get rid of this thing the first chance they get. Since no one is going to play this again, there is no point. It's a one and done product. Also, they don't want you to actually own anything and be happy. So to hell with Remedy, to hell with Epic, to the lowest circle with every single money grabbing con artist selling unfinished games at premium. Anyway, the boss fight. After playing tag for a while and turning on the lights, which go out after a moment anyway, the proper fight begins. And it's the most embarrassing excuse for a boss there has ever been. A floating granny throwing fart missiles. And after you unleash all your Nana hunting prowess for her second phase, she turns into a basic Last of Us zombie. This is the level of creativity we are dealing with. This is the game. Does this look like fun or challenging to anyone? So anyway, ding dong the bitch is dead, Grandpa Thor is safe, the peasants rejoice, and we are on our way back to the main plot. We need to talk. Boring! Filler episode is done, Saga makes her way back to Bright Falls, she's got the clicker, the FPC got Alan, and only with their powers combined can this shit show come to a close. As I mentioned, while our Dark Savior protagonist has been bumming around granny hunting, the Taken have near completely wiped out the FBC. Somehow, Saga can handle dozens of Taken all on her own, but the specialists get wiped. The only good guys still standing are Esteves and Casey. Lucky break! Nameless randos die in droves, and all the named characters are fine. Writer's favoritism on full display. Saga plans to give Alan the clicker, so that all of this can finally end. And this is yet another point where the writers decide to test their limits. How stupid can we make this? Back in chapter 4, before we briefly play as him, Alan got knocked out by a migraine attack, he wakes up, there are mutilated bodies all around him, something spooky is going on, why did the forces of darkness let him alone live? After the FPC arrive, the scene gets canonically cleaned up, which means there are people who witness this bloodbath, which means Estevez 100% knows about this, and yet she doesn't immediately question Alan about this put two and two together, and place him under some extra precautions. Like a specially designed containment unit, with built-in spotlights, like the one they have at hand. Everything that happens next, happens because both Alan, and Esteves, and everyone else inhabiting this universe is an indefensible ignoramus. So this Alan is Scratch, or rather Scratch is Alan's hide to his Jekyll, it's officially revealed right here. And the first thing the major villain of the story decides to do on screen to cement his presence as a credible threat, is to make every single retarded decision he can possibly muster. I have the clicker. You will fix this. You will save my daughter. Promise me. Yes. I promise, but we're out of time. Hurry! Don't ah! give it 
to him. Yeah. He's a fucking monster, Saga! There it is. We've been waiting for you, motherfucker. I'm gonna fucking destroy you! Scratch had just held off from spurging out for literally a second longer, Saga would have handed him the clicker, game over, right then and there, and even though he can fart cloud himself through walls, kill people in an instant, he decides not to do that with Saga, instead he slow walks after her, and we have ourselves yet another dull boss fight, Shoot the doofus to stun him, activate the generators, and the cockroach skitters away from the light. It's Scratch. He was pretending to be Wade. The plan is fucked. Esteban's come in. Scratch is here. How do I stop him? Bad news. Timid unit is trapped. The light array should affect him. Fuck. How do I activate the lights? I can turn them on from here. We do need to find the three power cores. This game is designed by people who have never played video games in their life. Which part about this is supposed to be engaging? This is tutorial boss levels of mechanical laziness. Scratch is a joke. The main antagonist monster slash her baddie in a horror story just got trounced. Midway through the game, in case the player has been laboring Saga's campaign out of the way first, Speaking of which, just one more mission left to go. And since we are close to the finish, best to wrap up the cult plotline. Yeah, there was a cult running around the woods ripping people's hearts out of their chests. That seemed important. Well, here comes the twisty wisty, subverting your expectations. Big revelation. Are you ready guys and gals? Hold on to your seats. The cult? Are they good guys? Dun dun dum. Yes, the fucking brilliant goal and plan of these nitwits was to assemble a fake cult, spread it as a rumor to the townsfolk, so that no one goes into the woods at night, and the cult is free to do their thing. That being exterminating taken that come out of the lake periodically, and the way to dispatch these teleporting darkness zombies is to carve a hole in their chest and use the clicker to purge the evil. You know, instead of using a flashlight and a gun, like we've been doing the whole game, and the cult has ample access to firearms, as seen in the opening, and all the stash boxes locked with minigames, Actually, why does the cult use axes against Saga once they become taken, instead of blasting her head open with a magnum? Where do all the guns disappear once the people turn into enemies? Game balance oblivion? Didn't stop Tweedle Twat and Tweedle Dum, so... What's the dealio? This is a twist for twist's sake. It's just a dumb switcheroo, because oh aren't we so clever, you thought the evil people were evil, we fooled you. Yeah, real clever, give yourself a cookie, with chocolate chips, made of shit. The plan is idiotic, the sheriff is an utter fool, this thing has been happening for 10 plus years, the cult isn't being secretive, and they still haven't been found out by the authorities? Yeah, fuck off, not buying it. And how did the plan fail with Nightingale? 
he turned into a zombie because the ritual was interrupted because they had witnesses. The writers want us to believe that even though the cult cut open his chest, took out his heart, they didn't bother to shove the clicker inside him and finish the job just because they had witnesses. And throughout all the time the dipshit duo was keeping watch in the woods, they couldn't be bothered to do it either. Everyone in the cult uses glue as a condiment for their deer burgers. Fuck this is dumb. And here's another thing. The mechanics of Taken have been completely changed. In the first game, the Taken were just people infected by the darkness. It took whoever it wished. It was silly, but the game didn't try to explain it any more than that. In the new game, the story tries to imply at several points that the Taken are created from the darkness in people's hearts, which lets the evil forces take control of them. Tweedle Dumb and Tweedle Twat are racist, sexist, corrupt cops, and so they turn into Taken. The ghost bitch hack is a bitter misanthrope, otherwise known as the condition of being a woman. Darkness of the Heart. Fucking Kingdom Heart shit. These adult children. Bunch of loser mental midgets. Actually trying to sell this as serious storytelling. And the game doesn't even follow its own rules. Saga fights against the cult. Turned into Taken. The whole game. How did each and every single one of them turn into raging zombies? Are all of them evil on the inside? Even though the cult was literally established to fight evil. All of this is a big fat clusterfuck of mismatched ideas. Stuff happening, motivations that make no sense, twist for the sake of it. The entire cult plotline is useless fluff, purely there for edge and mystery bait. And at the end it once more adds even further stupid contradictions to the narrative. The writers are morons, and anyone who enjoys this is a lobotomized clapping seal. The Posse of Useless Fuckwits, featuring Black Messiah Saga Anderson, concoct a plan to bring Alan back. For real this time. They are still under the impression that Scratch has been playing them, and that the real Alan is still stuck in the dark place. And because the story is actually that stupid, they are both correct and incorrect. Since the dark place resonates with artistry, turning fiction into reality, the plan is to use the power of rock and roll to save the day. Thor and Odin will put on an explosive show, somehow having the perfect song at the ready for this very moment, which will summon Alan from his nightmare. I don't like your plan. It sucks. This is some Denver shit, for fuck's sake, adults wrote this for adults. A whole lot of paranormal crimes happening right now. It's fucking awesome. I want a t-shirt. Wait, wait. One more time. It's fucking awesome. That delivery is amazing. Like, I would totally want a t-shirt. This is like totally amazeballs. And never mind helping. No need to shoot anyone from your elevated position. Just leave it all to Saga. Why the fuck is Saga on the shore anyway? Everyone should be sniping the zombies from the cliff. Stripped from the silly premise in this gritty survival horror game. On the gameplay side... This is just a horde battle mission. The goal is to survive until the end of the song. And if the clunk of the combat hasn't already bit you in the ass, this is where it becomes ferocious. Most of the time the game throws one or two enemies at you, three if they are being extra adventurous. They all come from the front, just blow them away as they approach. It's embarrassingly easy, but here, when the combat is pushed to its limit, with enemies coming from left and right, the stiff movement, the horrid gunplay, the broken flashlight boosting, everything comes together as a big pile of steamy shite. It's not fun, 
the gameplay sucks. This is not a satisfying challenge to overcome. When I beat it on my second try, it's just a sensation of thank the fucking fates finally. And you better pray to whatever force you believe in that you do not spend any more time here, because the song turns old fast. <laughs> Normal video game music is fine to listen to again and again, they are designed to be catchy loops in the first place, but a full song with lyrics? It's absolute cringe to have to rewind it back and listen again from the beginning. And this is coming from someone who actually enjoys Poets of the Fall, the real-life band responsible for most of the original pop-rock music in Remedy Projects. In fact, it makes me vomit thinking how these guys who actually know what they are doing, have their effort trapped inside this travesty. Also, this whole scene is a rip-off from the previous Alan Wake. There is an exact same type of horde battle with rock music blasting in the background, except the combat was better, and the song was better. Also, also, even though this is supposed to be some great climax for Saga's campaign, it falls flat er if the player has played Alan's campaign in the meantime. We just do what we always do. We'll chat, but instead of talking, we'll sing it! And sheltered with mama's pretty stories And you're all made up pure And mama gave me a magic clicker Well yes, I think it's true and fair to say Poets of the Fall song, a better song, another quirky moment, also out of place in this otherwise dour story. This one works a bit better, since it takes place inside a dream realm. If the whole game had this vibe, more in line with the first one, it would be more palatable. On its own, it feels like a stupid out of nowhere cartoon funny because random moment. Alan's campaign is pure wank, nothing matters, everything is just lame and weird in the safest way possible. The average person probably enjoys this on their first run, just from the shock and spectacle if nothing else. I have to admit, my interest was elevated as well, partly because I thought that the game was going to do a complete heel turn in tone and the rest of Alan's campaign would be a crazy creative acid trip. But no, this is the best we get. A walking simulator section, capped off with the same shitty combat, it's over in 10 minutes, and then the rest is dull again. It feels like a relic from a completely different project. Probably because of the whole plagiarizing their own work thing. And here's the problem with this kind of empty spectacle. Diminishing returns on repeat playthroughs, 
this scene is yet another chore to get through. It had more bearable than the rest of the game, just because the song is popping. Any value from this comes from the music itself. The poets are carrying the whole scene. Nothing on the game side is special or memorable, and it has no bearing on the story. For comparison, the iconic opera sequence from Final Fantasy VI is infinitely more entertaining. It's both dramatic and comedic, offers some great characterization for Celes, and the fact that they were able to pull it off back on the SNES makes it all that extra special. And though simplistic, the player was required to rehearse the song in the role of Celes and memorize a couple of lines before performing. Interactive storytelling. Rayman Legends has a bunch of special music themed levels, where the entire stage is timed with the song, every jump, every enemy, gameplay married with the soundtrack, some of the most fun levels in the game, and I'd like to point out that Hi-Fi Rush, an action game fully entwined with the soundtrack, as in every single second spent playing it, was released the same year as Alan Wake 2, there is nothing special here, and yet, without fail, the reviews rave about this scene in particular. Because pretty flashing lights stabbing my eyes and rock music blasting my ears feels nice, mmm. Embarrassing. A throwaway non sequitur music video, and everyone is just enamored with it. Tell me you've never truly enjoyed any actual video games without outright stating it. What's that? How's the rest of the soundtrack? Glad you asked. That old shit! The handful of instances there is any music, it's the most forgettable, droning, cliched movie music one could ever imagine. Not a single memorable tune. Aside from Poets of the Fall, every chapter is capped off with a variety of crappy pop songs. Get it? Like a TV show! All of them composed specifically for the game. How about? Allocating some of your budget to something worthwhile, like gameplay, level design, fixing bugs, you know, basic things. Once you have a functioning game, then you can splurge on the extra artsy crap. Summoning ritual is a success, and yet Alan is nowhere to be found. What's going on? No reason to beat around the bush, the game won't either, provided the player has completed both campaigns at this point. The end game of Alan Wake 2 begins with yet another grand revelation. We did bring Wake back from the dark place, with the song and the clicker. But he didn't end up here now. He landed on the shore after I faced Nightingale in the overlap. That night I found Wake here. He appeared because of this. The summoning. That was Wake. This is a time travel story. <laughs> oh. oh. After all the magical bullshit, reality-altering writing, 
and rock shows and supernatural light switch, the story suddenly decides to add in time travel as well. It has never worked like this. Any reality alteration has happened then and there, or slowly shifted in as time passes. It has never affected the past. And no, altering Saga's history does not count, because that is all fake memory revision and does not affect Saga herself. This is physical time travel, a person existing in two times at once. Alan is in the dark place at the end of his campaign, at the time of the summoning, and gets spat out into the real world a day prior in the past. Why does the music suddenly affect the past? Never explained. Why does it choose this specific time? Never explained. It's only done to cram in yet another bendy corkscrew of a twist. Alan gets summoned into the start of the game and tells Saga what she needs to know so that she ends up summoning him in the present so that he can appear in the past. Except the only reason he can even be present to tell Saga all she needs to know is because she already knows. Because Alan told her in an infinite loop. And since Alan is Scratch and Scratch wants to be freed into the real world as well, why does he try to kill Saga, either directly or by the Taken? If Saga dies, the time loop won't complete, and Alan won't escape, and neither will Scratch. So the villain is actively sabotaging himself? Time travel never makes sense, in any story, period. There is always contradictions, some paradox that shatters the whole thing, Closed time loops like this are no better, since the question still remains. What did the first loop look like? Nothing just manifests into being. Someone has to construct it. We never get to see what the timeline looked like before this loop was put in place. Because it is actually impossible to show in a coherent manner. Because time travel fundamentally does not work. Even if you somehow manage to avoid most of the issues, time travel is still among the biggest high concept story elements there are. It deserves the author's full attention. It's not just some random thing you can throw in a story and call it a night. The implications are infinitely enormous and they need to be examined thoroughly. But alas, most of the time, Authors don't use time travel to say something meaningful or to introduce some interesting mechanic in the case of gaming. No, the most common utility of time travel is for shit writers to make things up as they go. Reset, recontextualize, no matter if it makes sense, just do whatever. There are no stakes, because you can just retroactively fix everything, bring anyone back to life, just rewrite history. Run away from your problems. Time travel is a tool of cowards. No need to stand by with anything you write when you have the tool to redraft things in universe. No idea how Saga manages to put two and two together. There is nothing to indicate all of this was time travel. It could have just as well been that the summoning failed. But she needs to expo dump it to the audience, so she just has an epiphany. She is so smart and perceptive, this time even without the help of ghost whispering. Scratch wasn't pretending to be awake. They're the same person. He's here! Scratch! Watch out, Anderson! Estevez, Scratch is awake with the dark presence inside him. He wants the clicker. Change of plan. I'll lure him to the cell. <laughs> Surprise! Scratch appears, time for another boss fight, stun the bastard, activate the lights. Really slowly. The 
the containment does not work, since Scratch can just bail Alan at this point, and infect Casey instead, because fuck it. First he was a different person, then he was a different aspect of Alan, and now he's just free to jump from body to body. The rules are changing on the fly, as per the needs of given scene. Casey scratch my ass tosses Saga into the lake, killing her instantly. <coughs> Do not judge me, hope is all I have. No, she's just stuck in the dark place now. Going under the surface instantly teleports you away apparently. Scratch has the clicker, and he too teleports away, off to do all kinds of evil, because he is evil, and his wish is for more evil, because he's evil. Evil. I guess this would be the part where I let out my new trademark evil laugh. <laughs> Big brain laughed in triumph. Ha ha ha! And that was the final boss, by the by. Yes, that was the final confrontation with the big bad of the story. A repeat boss fight of the shittiest one in the game. Pathetic. Also, how long do you think the game will go on from here? A full hour. There is a whole goddamn hour of this dog shit still to go. Have the developers ever even heard of the concept of pacing? And how much gameplay will this hour hold? A whopping 5 minutes. No, walking around is not gameplay, and the case board is not gameplay. It's Alan's turn in the spotlight. For a brief minute, a single short trek through the same repeated woodlands, with a handful of enemies you can just run past. Whoop the fucking do. I got you every kind of weapon we have available. Don't fuck it up. Conveniently the exact weapons Alan uses. Seriously, not a single fully automatic weapon in the entire game. Scratch. The dark presence inside Casey. It threw Saga into the lake. If she ends up in the dark place, she could be there forever. It took me 13 years to get out. Zane never did. Tor and Odin went in after her, right? Maybe they'll get her out. With the power of rock and roll. I saw them when I was trapped there. They performed in my musical. I'm immediately less optimistic about this. Can you decide what your characterization is? Is it this? Or is it this? Pick one. Anyway, Alan makes his way to Bright Falls alone because the others have better things to do. We're doing this for you and our lovely saga. You take care of things on this side. If Scratch had brought the dark place here, this would take me back inside. 2010, I dived in, a leap of faith for Alice, with no idea that the cost would be a nightmare worse than death. It had taken me 13 years to get out. Now Alice was dead, because of me. And I was gonna make that leap again, this time knowing the cost all too well. here with me. I never had gotten out. Maybe after this I finally could. It was a fool's hope. I had no choice. I had to do it. That didn't make me any less terrified. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. And this arriving into town is framed as some kind of big epic moment. A hero's return. A final hurrah against the darkness. Which is sad, considering that the actual content of the scene is a bright annual bumpkin festival. 
no enemies, no grand shootout, just yet another walkie talkie section. This is Scratch's horrible evil vision for the world. This is what we've been trying to prevent the entire game. A deer themed costume festival. Oh, the horror? So spooky? What the fuck is that? And the writers are so up their own ass, they actually start dissecting their own work here. Right in the player's face, the NPCs suck off the writing in a pretentious, circle jerking, fart tasting, concentrated load of utter self pleased smugness, the likes of which is rarely seen anywhere. The stage fight scene in Departure is one upped by the absolutely mind frying Dark Ocean Summoning. But oh no, the villagers are turning all spooky and violent. Run, Alan, run for your life! What is even the point? What is the point of involving the player at all? Just make all of this a cutscene so that I can skip it. You don't respect my time and I don't give a shit about your wank fest. And because one chase was not enough, let's do another one. door blocks crazed people from chasing Alan. A door blocks the Max Payne fart cloud from chasing Alan. Windows don't exist. Access don't exist. The big bad evil antagonist is allergic to light. Even after obtaining the object of infinite power, which allows him to alter reality at will. This is a children's story, marketed for adults. Anyway, Alan ends up at the nursing home, where there's a conveniently placed writing room, an exact replica of his magic mental writing room, that just exists now, physically, so that Alan can start stitching up reality back together. Saga and I were both at the center of this story. She was now my co-author. And that's it for Alan. The game Alan Wake 2 started out with the new stunning and brave bestest ever character and it will end with the stunning and brave bestest ever character. Saga wakes up in the dark place and finds herself stuck inside her mind place. Yeah, the nomenclature in the game is creatively in line with everything else. So at this point, with 30 minutes of the story left to go, the writers decide that we need to suddenly have one of those idiotic fake drama lowest point moments, where the main character doubts themselves, even though they've been acing everything so far. Saga bitches and moans about being a terrible muffer, and a terrible detective, and a terrible partner, which is all true. But then she flips everything around and decides that, no, actually, I am an amazing muffer, and an amazing detective, and an amazing partner. I'm just the bee's knees. That's it. That's all that happens. And this takes 20 minutes. The player has to fiddle with the case board, walk around, and fiddle with the case board again, and Saga profiles herself, and then even more case board. There is no development, Saga learns nothing, it's like the writers took a single glance at the hero's journey blueprint, saw the rebirth part, and just stuck this in here because they have no understanding of pacing or emotional investment. If you are not willing to make the character change, or be actually critical of themselves, 
if you refuse the rebirth, then don't pretend to have one. Not every character has to experience some kind of spiritual growth for the story to function. Do not force it, and especially do not try to sell this embarrassment as something meaningful. This is the standard nowadays. This is the only way modern day writers can write women and minorities. They have no flaws, they have no struggles, they just pat themselves on the back and get constantly validated by the script. My life, my family is just part of a book. Another white asset deciding what I get to do, how I get to do it. The game begins with a white man giving away all of his agency for the stunning and brave black woman. The titular white character makes the black woman the main character in his own story because she is so much better than him and the only person who can save the world. Shut the hell up, you dumbass person. Get that chip off your shoulder, you horrid nagging cunt. The diabetes infants just can't help themselves. They can't. They have to shove that white man bad propaganda in there whether or not it makes any sense in universe. Fuck you, bunch of racist man-hating retards. And fuck you, Sami, you dickless, enabling, actual race traitor cock piece of human filth. And following that disaster, Saga takes a walk through the fake city and cleans up Alan's mess. And the next part will sound utterly insane, Again, but bear with me, I'm just telling you what happens on screen. There's the clicker and a bullet of light inside a shoebox, which are made manifest by photos taken by Alan's wife Alice, who is also in the dark place and has been guiding Alan throughout the game, or that's what the story claims. In truth, Alan finds these postmodern art videotape installations of Alice, where she describes herself being tormented by Scratch after the events of the first game. Alice is not a character in this game, she is this live action talking head, speaking in the most boring, pretentious way for minutes on end. No joke, these take up 10 minutes of the game combined. Just staring at this for 10 minutes. This video game is not a game. It's a hollow wank piece by a self-indulgent idiot. It takes 10 full minutes for Alice to tell us that there was a boogeyman under her bed and she just couldn't take the PNG jump scares anymore, so she decided to yeet herself off a cliff. She's not dead, she just ended up in the dark place. The game claims that Alice has been playing some kind of 4D chess with Alan, so that things will happen as they need to happen. Nothing specific, just mystery bait. Just like everyone else, Alice is an absolute fool. If you want to guide Alan, then talk to him. Speak like an actual person, have a conversation with him, there is no need for all this complicated, covert, artsy-fartsy bullshit. The world is about to end, you stupid bitch. People are dying, and you are wasting time playing the part of a mystical sage. For a story all about writing, the writers have no idea how to wield the power of words. Just talk. Tell it like it is. Be direct. Anyway, Alice has taken a picture of a bullet of light, and this now physical bullet of light will be the key to fixing everything. But how does Saga find the bullet of light? Well, in Alan's campaign, he got a phone call from himself from the future. You need to go back to the talk show studio basement. Get Alice's photos from a shoebox there. Before you can go to Parliament Tower, you must put the photos into the shoebox at her statue at the plaza. So that Saga can find it, instead of just using the magical MacGuffin himself. Because we need the new Marisu protagonist to do the physical thing to fix everything. 
which in this case means shooting Alan in the face. Yes, that's the ending. Saga teleports into Alan's magical writing room, and they decide the only way to end all of this is to shoot Alan in the face with the bullet of light. I swear I'm not making this up. This is how they will fix everything. The new diverse female hero shoots the titular main character in the face. Modern reboot sequels in a nutshell. And here's one of the most insulting aspects of the game that I've neglected to mention yet. The story actually tries to offer rules and limitations to the reality alteration, but they are made so vague that it basically means nothing. Anything the writer wants to happen can happen, and will happen, force it to happen. So there's a problem with the ending? I don't have the ending. It has to be perfect, but I don't have time to figure it out. I don't know what to do. Fuck. I'm so sorry. This whole thing is a fucking mess. I agree. But we can still figure this out. And what exactly does perfect mean? The elements of the ending need to come from the story's pre-existing parts. To make matters worse, this is a horror story. You don't need to tell me this is a horror story. Right. The ending has to fit the genre if it's going to work. In a horror story, there are only victims and monsters. There must be a way to bring a hero into the story. If there is a hero, they will ultimately pay a heavy price. I have an idea how to help Casey. He's a real person who I twisted into a character. He isn't my creation, so he isn't a suitable host for the Dark Presence. I can write that into the ending to drive that fucking thing out of it. So the ending has to be earned, set up by the story. You can't build a case without supporting evidence. That's the only way to make it stick. Well, if the ending has to fit the story, this is how I see it. Return is a story about a story that comes true. And I'm a character in the story. Not just a character. The hero. Okay, a hero. <laughs> in any case, I've been through hell to be here. And this is my life. It feels earned to me that I rise above the story and be there to create the ending. Alan? Saga, I finished it. The ending we talked about. I have the clicker and the bullet of light. Let's do this. I have to be the one to do it. I feel like I've always been on this journey. It must end here, this darkness. What lies under the surface now shifts. A play of shadows catching my eye, thrusting my face into the water. He's here. It's shockingly cold, past the mirror of the surface. And I will see. Can I see? The end. Scratch. the shadows and reveals the hidden horror. And in that moment of silence, the whispered message finally heard. Come on, you Come on! What if there's nothing waiting to be revealed? The play of shadows fool us all, subterfuge to get our price of admission. Darkness not as a monster, but as emptiness. We're none the wiser. No answers, no truths. The hero turns to look inside. It's destroyed by what he sees and is redeemed. Saga said we're both heroes. I'll pay that price. So will she. We are here to kill the monster. I pray nothing comes after this. Nothing will sleep. This is how we win. Is it too easy? What if this is still the dark place? Another dream to wake up from, always coming back to the beginning. The memory of what came before burned away by this terrible realization. Maybe it's a mercy, forgetting. To know nothing when we loop around, back to the...
Anderson. The rules state that reality alteration must be done within the confines of some arbitrary storytelling guidelines, as in it needs to be in the spirit of the story. This is done to shut down the logical question from the audience. Why doesn't Alan just write? And then the enemies all died and all the good guys lived happily ever after the end and fix everything that way. It's a wasted effort because that's what basically ends up happening anyway. The writer specifically sets up a rule, spoken out loud by the titular character of the piece, and yet does not follow it. We can do this ridiculous thing, but we can't do this other equally ridiculous thing. And look at this. Look at it. Read what it says on the screen. After all this wasted time, after all this ridiculous bullcrap, this thing dares promote logical consistency in storycraft. That is what I've been advocating for, while you have been parading endless nonsense. The end is no different. The characters invent things in the moment to justify the plot, the story concludes with an ass pulled deus ex machina, and Saga literally stating that she feels like she deserves to win. Oh, and also, it's the exact same fucking ending as the first game. And I know some chuckle fucks are out there arguing that, uh, actually, that's the point. The plot is supposed to be a mess, because Alan, or Scratch, or whoever, are bad at writing. It's a deep meta-commentary about deep complexity of script writing complexity deep stuff and you don't get it because you don't complex. Sounds like loser talk. Joke's on you, I was only pretending to be retarded. Guess what, dipshit? If you act like a moron, and speak like a moron, if you write a moronic story, then your story is moronic. No one is safe in a good horror story. Certainly not the protagonist. That's what makes them fun. In a horror story, there are only victims and monsters. And the trick is not to end up as either. This is something Alan Wake does a lot. Both the franchise and the character. They make these sweeping statements about storytelling, which are all horseshit. It's like something a fart-suckling essayist offers as a writing advice. Rules that are not actually rules. It sounds nice to an untrained ear, but spend more than a second to actually ponder it, and the statement reveals itself as pure nonsense. I'm my own deus ex machina? Really? Very meta indeed! This is the crux of this whole dozen hour narrative exercise. Sami obviously wants to appear as an intellectual, a thoughtful person, like he has some deep connection to the nature of writing. His ego-stroking author persona is fully on display. Fundamentally, writing a story about writing is cringe in itself. But what exactly does Sami do with it? Alan's horror stories are titled Departure, Initiation, and Return. Oh, the hero's journey. What does it mean? Nothing, just a reference. Alex Casey has the same name as Alan's fictional detective, and the same face as Max Payne, who is also Sami himself. Oh, what does it mean? Nothing, just a reference. Very meta indeed! Being meta is not an accomplishment in itself. Just like putting anything in your story is not an accomplishment in itself, it's dependent on what you do with those elements. Every component has to bolster the others. Your story is a building, and every second you add is another brick. Every material has the correct usage. Wrong part in the wrong place makes the structure unstable. As for meta specifically, why would you purposefully break the fourth wall this blatantly at every turn? Why do you refuse to allow the audience to be immersed? There is no way to believe, even for a fleeting second, that this is a living, breathing world, and any of this actually matters, when the story slaps the audience in the face every five minutes and screams, 
Look, it's meta! Aren't we clever? This is the game. Random stuff in a sequence. References to itself. References to older works. And name dropping things related to writing. That's it. You have all these grand elements to work with. Altering realities. False memories. Puppeteering by a higher power. Art. The product of the soul affecting the world. Time travel. Over dozen hours of game. And you can't come up with a single profound idea or meaningful moment. There is nothing of value here. It's not an ocean, it's not a lake, it's deep as a puddle, and it smells like piss. Imagine being in your 50s and releasing this as your magnum opus. Listen, Sami, go play an actual video game for once in your life. Go play near Automata, play Soma, play Omori, play Talos Principle, play Chained Echoes, or if you are too much of a boomer to play video games, read Opus by Satoshi Kon, then, after you realize what an absolute hack you are, go jump in a lake, and make sure it's in the middle of winter. And it's still not over. The mid credit scene shows that the loop is still going, Alan is still stuck in the dark place, only it's not a loop, it's a spiral. Oh my god, so hype, can't wait for the sequel. Or rather new game plus DLC. Yes, this $60 game is not complete. There's a post-launch new game plus with added story content and a higher difficulty. Ooh, can't wait to hate it. 13 years since the original game's cliffhanger ending, and the sequel doesn't even have the common decency to actually end. How did we start? Alan is stuck in the dark place. And how did we finish? Alan is stuck in the dark place. The entire game is a worthless filler arc. The actual ending to this stupid saga comes in the form of the final draft campaign. I was actually hoping to get this video done before the DLC came out, so that I could just leave it be. But for the sake of completion, let's suffer through this one more time. I played the brand spanking fresh nightmare difficulty just to get the full experience. No surprises, nothing interesting, it's just buffed numbers, enemies do more damage, and take a bit more punishment, easy peasy as the previous run, lazy, utter waste. And here's something to just further drive home the sheer incompetence on display. The game does not let the player pick which save file they want to use for their new game plus. I was forced to use my first run, not my most recent one. The game automatically picks it for me. And here's the thing, my original save doesn't even exist anymore. I already overwrote all of my old saves, because for some baffling reason this game only has three save slots. I can't access my old save, it does not exist. Yet the game somehow manages to drag it out of virtual oblivion. If the game secretly preserves save files like this, why aren't there more save slots? So what exactly is new story-wise? That's the thing, not a whole lot. The pretentious opening monologue is new, promising that this time everything will turn out totally different. There's a single added bit of foreshadowing to the bullet of light, by which I mean Alan finds another photo randomly lying on the floor. Other than that, it's the exact same experience. I ran through it as fast as I could, and it still took me 8 hours. The game forces me to play through the entire game yet another time, my third run, so that I get to witness the three additional minutes to the ending cutscene. I am not kidding, the new hyped story content is a slightly extended ending. This time Scratch is gone for good, Logan is confirmed to be safe, and Alan is a god of reality or some bollocks.
And so I return. With me, I bear the torch of knowledge, the light, the miracle illuminated, the master of two worlds. No, the master of many worlds. Question. Since the story made a major point about the characters having to sacrifice something, so that it's in the spirit of horror or whatever bullcrap, because otherwise the reality alteration won't stick, what does anyone sacrifice here? Saga lives, Casey lives, Logan will be fine, Alan lives, ascends to godhood, and he will get to reunite with his wife by the end. That's the ending. Nothing in this loop happened differently, and yet somehow it led to a different extended result. This game baited me to suffer through it for a third time, for a single new cutscene. Also, remember that time Mr. Door talked about the next time we meet? Well, here's the canonical next time, and it's the exact same conversation as last time. Setup? No payoff. Wait for the sequel. What is the point? Why couldn't this be part of the base game? Why did they release this separately post-launch? All they did was re-add a snippet of film back to where they obviously cut it from. At this point, it's just open disrespect for the audience's time. And the game is still not complete! There is also a $20 season pass for some more upcoming random wank. Give us more money, you stupid consumer! On Ultima. I despise the utter avarice rampant in modern gaming. These companies peddling this as the new standard are scum. They dare demand more money. Anything they come up with should be part of the base game, starving for content. And also, none of the glitches have been fixed. The game is broken in every way imaginable, and we are supposed to give these fucks even more of our hard-earned cash? This thing does not deserve any of the attention, or acclaim, or money. It's actually sickening. Think of all the great games you can get, or have gotten for $60 or less. Full experiences, tight gameplay, lots of content, decent story, which doesn't get in the way. You can imagine any game, and I guarantee it will be better than this. This? is the nadir of gaming industry. You know what hopes I had coming into all this. I expected a decent time, a functional story, a video game doing its job, and offering me some worthwhile entertainment in exchange for my time and money. I want a refund. So what can we learn from this experience? It should be rather obvious after all the time I've spent bashing this game. And I also told you right at the beginning. But let's spell it out again anyway. Alan Wake 2 is horrible. Alan Wake 2 is also touted as a masterpiece. By critics and consumers alike. Here's the black pill. The critics, professional YouTubers, and vast portions of the gaming populace are all irredeemable idiots. They do not know what the hell they are talking about, they have no standards. If anyone tries to tell you this thing has any value, stop listening to them, they will turn you stupid as well. This is not an issue of opinion. If you unironically claim this game is good, no, not even good, if you claim it is acceptable, you forfeit the right to criticize any story or any video game for now and forever. Anything you might dislike in another product, Alan Wake 2 does that exact thing. Guaranteed. Horrid characters, horrid dialogue, horrid plot, Horrid world building, horrid gameplay, barely any gameplay, game breaking glitches, $60 digital only release, $20 season pass for an unfinished game, pandering, blatant attempts at social engineering. This is a game made by people who do not enjoy video games, to an audience who do not care about video games. 
Ever since gaming gained mainstream popularity in the double O's, most gamers have become normies. That's just how things are. The average person does not like playing video games, they do not care about mechanics, or the unique interactive storytelling tools afforded only to games. They want to sit on their worthless ass and watch a shit movie or a shit TV show with the same shitty tropes and plots they've seen a thousand times already. The less game there is, the better, since the game part potentially requires skill from the participant. This is the ultimate gaming journalist consumer game. Watching someone play this is the exact same experience as holding the controller yourself. There is no replay value, and the first time through is pure agony. But most people refuse to think for themselves. They have to suck off the new shiny thing, so that they get to be part of the club. Circle jerk the current product everyone raves about. After all, telling people what they want to hear is where the money and attention is. Don't piss off the fanboys, just chill, obey the narrative, Get excited for the next pile of shite. It's the old the emperor isn't wearing any clothes thing. And most people are too dumb or chicken shit to speak the truth. This thing is an unintentional parody of the current state of gaming as a whole. And people are slurping up all the slop with mighty appetite. And here's a last minute plot twist for you. I am actually a shareholder at Remedy. This is not a bit. I'm not memeing. I actually own Remedy stock. I have a direct monetary incentive to sing this game's praises. To sell this and all future Remedy products to you. And yet, I decided to do the exact opposite. You are a smart person. I'm sure you can deduce who in the YouTube sphere is full of shit and who is on the side of truth. I spit on all the shills and hype morons. If you praise Alan Wake 2, your viewpoint is worthless. People with no taste, no standards, the mindless moron masses, they are the reason why everything in entertainment sucks nowadays and will keep turning even worse. We have to demand more. If we settle for garbage, we will be fed garbage for all eternity. Every piece of art should be judged by what it's trying to do. And since Alan Wake 2 places all its focus on its dramatic narrative, it has to be pristine to be called successful. It is not. I've proven it is not. I've shown you the game. As for the guys who genuinely enjoy this crap, there's basically two types. The first are the ones who are so dumb, they get mesmerized by the clusterfuck narrative. And since they can't tell what the hell is going on, they determine that the story must be really complex and deep. The second type is even worse. They are the ones who live surrounded by their own anal mist, constantly jerking themselves off thinking how smart they are. They understand art. They can see all the complexity and deep symbolism and themes and they just can't stop wanking alongside the author because the things they consume is their whole personality. Go ahead, look around YouTube or whatever site you like. Everyone who praises this game either can't come up with anything tangible to compliment about the game, just saying it's a masterpiece, or they are full-on ego-stroking pseudo-intellectual twats making up theories and passing their own personal feelings as objective analysis. This is the definition of dumb person smart story. It's made by people who think they are intelligent, yet speak to the lowest common denominator. So obviously, it also appeals to people suffering from bad case of Dunning-Kruger. Alan Wake 2 is not complex nor deep. 
there is nothing to get. Beneath all the convoluted nonsense lies a simplistic tale about a bunch of morons versus generic evil being evil for the sake of it. It's baby's first fantasy. It has nothing more to offer. Art has only two purposes. To entertain, as in it has to be pleasing to the senses, or to act as a commentary on the human condition, as in it has to have a point. Alan Wake 2 accomplishes neither of these. It is an awful story told badly. Thank you for watching. Assessing from the fact that you are still here, you must have found some value from this multi-hour ramble. If so, consider helping out the channel by doing the things the algorithm likes. Subscribe, leave a comment, hit the like button, heck, hit the dislike button. They both do basically the same thing. Special thanks to everyone following my work. Extra special thanks to all the patrons. And a humble bow and kudos to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Six Stars, Jesaja Vanderwatt, Danny Kicks, and Adona Daniel. If you would like to join these fine people, you can find the link down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.